one. Hello and welcome to the second in our series, AI Spring. Um, and the title of, the, of today's session is AI is Here. This is um, it's the first time you've been watching. This is, a, this is part of the Doctor Consortium Initiative, something that we set up within Digital Futures, um, whereby we, um, <clears throat> we find a platform to, to share resources around the world. Um, it seemed to us an obsolete concept to have individual professors in individual classrooms talking with, to a small group of students, um, especially at a doctoral level when the groups are so small, when we could be sharing an international platform and bring all these ideas uh, to people around the world um, to develop what, I, what I, I've been calling other people too, a kind of global brain, whereby you have an immediate feedback with everyone and uh, produce some astonishing results. Um, so uh, let me just simply say that this is then the second in a series. Um, uh, last week we had introductory one, um, uh, 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 what is AI? Um, all of these sessions um, are being recorded in, on, on our, um, our, our Digital Futures uh, YouTube channel. Next week we have Memo Acton, AI and Distributed Consciousness. I would say Memo is one of the, the extraordinary polymaths of our contemporary age. Um, someone who's both an engineer by training and also a computer scientist, but also an artist and a philosopher, uh, somebody who was extraordinary uh, take on things. So I'm really delighted to have Memo um, uh, here with us next next week. Um, we then move on to the future of the, the design studio, looking at the impact um, of particularly of diffusion uh, uh, platforms on on the design studio. It's something it's history in the making we're seeing right now, and we want to just be record very quickly some of the kind of comments from some of the leading uh, uh, designers and educators uh, around the world, and literally around the world, um, to find out what uh, how they're, they're they're working with their students. Um, uh, the next session is the future of the architectural office, uh, where we're bringing Patrick Schumacher and several others to think, to speculate about how the office itself will change because of the introduction of AI. And that's more a long term thing say, than what's happening right now. Uh, and then we have a break for Acadia, followed by four different series which should look at the different books that have been um, that have been published uh, recently. Let me just simply sort of say that um, the timing of this uh, is going to vary slightly with daylight savings. Um, I think the last weekend in October, Europe only goes, goes forward the, the, uh, the, the clocks. Um, and then the first weekend of uh, November, um, uh, the United States goes forward. Meanwhile, in China, there is no change in, in the clock. So um, it's 10 o'clock to begin with. And from November onwards, it's going to be from 11 o'clock onwards. Um, so and in Europe, um, well, we'll have to take into account this as we go, because it's quite complicated. I won't explain it now. Um, but just to say, uh, this is the, the kind of the, the block, as it were, on the, on the top, these five sessions in blue, are looking at the, the new diffusion platforms, and then the four, the four sessions in, in yellow, looking at the publications that have come out. And really, I think this is what this whole uh, uh, series is all about, the notion of the AI spring, which I will explain in more detail today. Um, but it's really about two things. The fact that we now have um, a series of, of books that have, a series of, of tools that have come out that are transforming things. And I discussed last week, the shift that we had from the very first um, uh, generated image, um, Rethik Anadol did based on the, the Zaha Hadid, um, the work of the Zahadid office um, uh, using GANs. And now what's happening on the right-hand side, my work, but it could be any other, anyone else's, um, looking at how you can take the work of Zaha and, 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 and hallucinate yourself in a much quicker way. Um, uh, that seems to me a threshold moment when suddenly we realize the potential of AI. Uh, but then alongside that, the other facet of this AI spring, as I'm calling it, are the number of publications that will have come out. And we will be dealing with these in the second part of the series. Um, bring in the authors and editors of these particular books. I'm going to refer today to some of the thinking behind my own book here um, in terms of trying to contextualize the, the, the session in terms of timing, in terms of the chronology as it were. Um, but I want to start with something that I, um, I, I came across just this week, um, an article by Aaron Betsky, where he mentions um, this will be the year of AI, or at least one of his colleagues I'd mentioned this colleague at Virginia Tech, um, and this will be the year of AI, and I'm not sure we are equipped for it. I think this is, in a sense, is really what's behind the whole 
series, um, we, we, we are not equipped for it yet. We don't know what's happening. And uh, it's really all about sharing experiences and, um, and, and highlighting strategies and so on. But that's been my point all along. AI is now, it, this is the year of AI. This is the whole point of the series is to celebrate and to examine what exactly is going on in terms of the world of AI, in terms of architecture. Now, what's been happening recently is there's been a kind of a, a, a deluge of these new um, uh, um, diffusion platforms that have been appearing. And in the last week, there's a, a diffusion platform for movies that's been launched by Meta. Um, and it seems to me that, that, that this is in the nature of the, what we could call Moore's law, the, the way in which um, technology uh, speeds up. Um, the term Moore's law was, was, um, was, was, uh, was, was coined back in the, in, the, in the 60s by Gordon Moore, who was an basically industrialist who made the observation the number of transistors on an integrated circuit board would double every year and the price would have halved. He then changed it to two, every two years. Um, and this was became known as Moore's Law and was applied by Ray Kurzweil to all forms of technology. Um, uh, of course, Moore's Law doesn't go on forever. So Kurzweil then developed a, what he calls the law of diminishing returns. But essentially, it's very, something very similar, which is to say that the speed of change is exponential. By that, I mean the, 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 the progress is not one, two, three, four, but one, two, four, eight, 16, and so on. Um, things speed up. Um, we saw this with COVID and we're seeing it with technology. The rate of change is just astonishing. Also what happened this week, as those who were, were watching was uh, Tesla's um, AI week, which uh, Elon Musk introduced. Um, and this I think was a, an extraordinary moment when they, they introduced the, the new robot uh, Optimus, um, uh, which uh, Android robot, um, which they're developing, um, and and which is which is which is just developing over time, um, uh, and we'll, we'll, the, the final version is likely to be with us very soon. Um, for uh, um, and this was an astonishing event. I think Elon Musk is is uh, also one of these kind of polymath figures who has a global picture about everything, and I think this was quite astonishing. Um, this might not seem to you to be. Um, that special in some senses, because we've seen robots leaping around, doing dances and so on. Um, and it, you might think, oh, well, uh, Tesla's got a long way to catch up. But the point is that actually really what we're looking at is, in a sense, uh, the application of AI to robots, um, uh, which, is, which, is, which is astonishing. So in, in what we find with some of the, the previous sort of models um, uh, that, we, that we've been, been looking at, that actually, uh, and this is an example of Boston Dynamics, a kind of a... Um, a demo um, that they put forward um, when they were being acquired. Um, and it's showing you kind of robots that are, that are dancing along with Spot the dog and so on. Um, uh, and it, it's easy to be in some ways fooled by this, um, but actually they have no capability for vision, these robots. They, they, and what they're doing essentially, have been, they've been pre-trained. Um, they've been pre-trained um, whereby, whereby um, a motion capture has been used to kind of to track the, the behavior of humans. Uh, and this and this has been programmed into the robots themselves. So while they look as though they're dancing spontaneously, there's nothing at all spontaneous about this. And it's essentially mapping human behaviors onto robots, uh, but they have no capacity for vision. So what really what's happening with, um, uh, <clears throat> with, um, with Tesla, with the, the Optimus robot is something way beyond this, uh, way beyond this, it's essentially, a self-driving car on, on two legs, as it were. Um, and we're talking about something truly astonishing. I worry why, why Optimus looks like a, a human. Why does it need to be an Android robot? It seems to me one of the, the comments that I, I get, gave last week uh, by um, Elon Musk, the idea that technology um, made us into sort of into superhumans because we had an extension of ourselves in our, in our phones and so on. It seems to me that maybe it would have been made, make more sense for the Optimus to not look like a human, to be able to do other things that we can't do, because it seems to be a, it doesn't make sense to me anyway, to, it should try to mimic exactly what humans are doing. Um, anyway, um, so things are happening on a regular basis and they're happening really quickly. Um, interestingly, Elon Musk was once, was asked uh, 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 on, on Friday, what he thought was his, um, what would be his favorite moment in history to be, um, uh, to be around. Um, and he said, well, now, now is the most exciting time um, in, by, in many ways. Um, uh, I always think that maybe um, that, the, 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 that maybe the, we should also talk about the future as well. And I, to my mind, I do, I share Elon Musk's thoughts. I do think this is an extraordinary time. And I do think there are some amazing things happen. It is, a, it is probably one of the most, in my own career, 
the most extraordinary moment beyond the kind of developments of decon and, and in the 90s. This is something very special, which is accompanied by also a th new theoretical agenda in the world of neuroscience. Something very interesting is happening. And I'm kind of tempted to kind of like uh, to, to kind of quote the, uh, Alan Turing here, who made the, makes the comment, this is only a foretaste of what is to come and a shadow of what is going to be. The point being that all those books that, we, that I showed you were, set, were several years in the making. And right now there's software in the making that is going to radically transform everything we know about architecture in three to five years. Um, I like to think about the relationship with the past and the future, not as being discrete entities, but to see them as interconnected. Um, Wolf Pricks has given a lecture that, where he's entitled it once, um, in two days, uh, tomorrow will be yesterday. Another version of that would be to say, um, tomorrow, today will be yesterday. But I think past and future are connected in a way, in the most extraordinary sort of way. So today I want to go and look at the time frame, both of the past of AI and the origins of AI, and also the potential futures of AI. Um, so today there are gonna to be uh, um, three sections. Um, I'm gonna talk about, the, and it's a, a cursory overview, um, but it's kind of, um, it's like an idiot's guide, shall we say, to the history of AI. Like, just to highlight some of the points that I came across in my own research, um, then to mention briefly the potential future of AI, and then we're gonna have some, a series of presentations. Um, I'm delighted to say that we have um, a number of very talented designers um, with us, and I will introduce them as, as they um, as they present. So we'll have a kind of Pecha Kucha style um, uh, demonstration or, or uh, presentation of these of this different work. And it's, I think it's it, just to kind of flesh out the, the extraordinary moment in which we find ourselves. So let's start off um, uh, with the origins of, of AI. And I'm going to uh, keep with uh, Alan Turing um, to, to begin with. Alan Turing was the first person who really conceptualized about the possibility of AI um, in a paper that he that was published in 1950, uh, Computing Intel Machinery and Intelligence. Of course, we had debates last week about whether intelligence is the right term to apply uh, to, to uh, what we call AI. Um, but anyway, um, the first kind of reference to that was this paper by Alan Turing, who of course had been instrumental in, in, in launching um, computation itself. Um, he is, of course, famous for um, the bomb, this uh, code-breaking machine um, that uh, cracked the Nazi Enigma code during the Second World War and reduced the length of the Second World War by many, uh, many years and, and, and saving millions, literally millions of lives. Um, what is interesting about this, of course, was the fact that nobody knew about this until the 1970s because of the Official Secrets Act, and it was all kept under wraps, as it were. Um, Alan Turing himself um, died in 1954. He wasn't actually there to, um, to live to see the, the, the coining of the term AI. At the same time, um, uh, nobody, uh, he didn't live long enough for people to, for the official secrets to come out. So he, does, he died in a certain, um, uh, almost as an unknown. I mean, he was famous in some ways, but not as famous as he is today. And he died probably through suicide. Uh, he'd been um, in, involved in a, a, a case uh, where he was convicted of lewd acts um, uh, of, of, uh, of being a homosexual. It, that was since pardoned by, um, by uh, uh, Tony Blair um, but more recently. But the point being, he'd been through this moment of disgrace and this might have contributed to his suicide. But whatever happened, um, he died in 54 um, before the term AI was even invented. Um, we all know about him now, of course, because of the, uh, the movie that's come out and because he appears on the, the, the 50 pound note in the UK, but that wasn't the case um, when he was alive. Very few people believed, realized that recognized that, that, that this genius, Alan Turing had really um, saved the world in many ways by, um, or sort of helped save millions of lives and had helped to bring the second year, the second world war to a premature end. The imitation game um, is I would say a, is a reference also to a game that we've been played, um, a parlor game, shall we say, in the UK. Um, which kind of led into the Turing test. You would play a role in this game, the imitation game, and like in the Turing test, the question is whether you could find out whether you were real human or computer. Um, so we all know about him now, but that wasn't the case. As somebody from the UK who was brought up um, with a weekly dose of Doctor Who, um, this always struck me as being intriguing. Um, uh, what I find, find interesting about Doctor Who is that he's, he's basically somebody with a PhD in technology. He's not a medical doctor, he's got a PhD in technology, and what's more, um, like Alan Turing himself, and what's more, um, 
he solves the problems of the world, not through a fist fight like most of the American superheroes, Spider-Man, uh, Superman, and so on. He never see him getting, getting into a fight, he or she getting into a fight. Um, he's the, the doctor who solves the problems of the world by, the, the, by using uh, science and technology. Um, I speculated about whether, in fact, doctor, whether uh, Dr. Alan Turing was the original Doctor Who. Uh, in fact, uh, um, the Doctor Who was launched in the 1960s. So um, uh, before it was known that uh, Alan Turing had done what he'd done, because the, the Official Secrets Act was still there. So, um, so it, strictly speaking, of course, in terms of chronology, um, it, it, uh, he couldn't have been the, 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 the uh, the, the, the inspiration behind Doctor Who, but then Doctor Who is a time lord, so the normal rules of time don't apply to Doctor Who. Uh, in fact, it was in 1956 that the, um, the term artificial um, intelligence was coined, and it was coined for a, a meeting, a summer workshop, as it were, that was called uh, bringing together some of the, the, the best and the brightest uh, academics, young academics in, uh, uh, in the world at the time, especially in the States. Um, it, was in Dart it was held in Dartmouth College in the States. And here you can see some of the, the leading lights. Um, Marvin Minsky, who went on to become a, play a significant role at MIT Media Lab. Claude Shannon um, as uh, uh, somebody who was um, also been hugely significant uh, and the person who's not, not in this photograph, but uh, John McCarthy was the one who actually coined the term artificial intelligence. Um, he was never very happy with the term. He'd come across it somewhere. He couldn't find where he'd come across it, but uh, he had to call it something. So he called it artificial intelligence. My view is that we should probably call it synthetic and synthetic in, um, intelligence, and maybe question even the use of the term intelligence itself to, in order to differentiate from, from human intelligence. AI doesn't have consciousness, is not sentient, cannot think and so on. Um, but what happened after that, after this very optimistic moment where they thought within two years they would have solved most of the basic problems, was actually they faced a number of trouble, a number of challenges. Um, uh, the, when they've been proposing, there were as a result of, of, of these challenges what are referred to as AI winters. These are moments when uh, there was a collapse in, in confidence uh, in AI, a collapse in confidence that uh, led to the reduction the, uh, to the uh, removal or reduction in the funding, um, basically because AI had been overhyped. Uh, it failed to live up to its it, to its um, to its promise. And in particular, um, one of the key issues uh, at the time we're talking about the Cold War um, was uh, the the was the the, the, the challenge of, of translating. Um, in particular, in the States, they were very keen on, on being able to automatically translate um, Russian. Um, in the end, uh, uh, this proved to be more challenging than they had imagined. And uh, some of the curious, uh, rather comical results at the time are kind of uh, are well known. Um, the, 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 the expression out of sight, out of mind was, was translated into Russian um, through one of these machines and back into English. And what came out was the term inv an invisible lunatic. Um, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Um, came out as the vodka is good, but the meat is rotten. I can remember in the, in the school playground, we were joking about these things uh, when I was a young kid in the UK. Um, uh, so there were challenges and, and, and uh, challenges also internally within the, uh, the world of AI. I didn't um, uh, mention last week, but one of the other differentiations that we have to look at is the differentiation between the different approaches towards AI. There are actually five different approaches of which the two dominant ones are the symbolic um, approach, which basically is arguing that you can, you can uh, you, you use, which uses uh, inverse deduction to come up with a solution. And then what's called the connectionist approach, which is using neural networks, which is in other words modeled, albeit somewhat loosely on the brain itself. Um, well, in 1969, um, the, the research in, in, that, the, the, in the area of, of, of connectionism and neural networks was really challenged by a publication by uh, Seymour Papa and uh, Marvin Minsky about perceptrons, where they basically said that this is, this is very unimpressive, it's not giving us very much, um, and, uh, um, uh, and we should in, instead invest in symbolic AI. So that changed the course of, of, of the development in many ways, and this was also, in some senses, this shift was also um, exacerbated in some way by the death, the early death of Frank Rosenblatt, who was one of the leading figures who had great belief in the potential of, of, um, of, of connectionism um, when he died in, uh, in 1971 in a, in a boating accident at the age of, I think, 42, 43. Um, so in the end, we had, they had spent symbolic AI came into the dominance and, and, and didn't frankly achieve as much as was expected in 50 years after the initial meeting 
the survivors, as it were, got back together um, uh, to, um, and here we can see, this is John McCarthy and this is um, Marvin Minsky, um, uh, 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 and to, to celebrate, but actually, in, in effect, there was little to celebrate. In the first 50 years, AI had been pretty much a disappointment. It had got a lot of uh, kind of, in, it had been invested a lot of in, uh, expectations, but it failed to deliver. But by a curious coincidence, um, around that time, around 2006, we saw, suddenly saw the deep learning revolution the developed neural nets that really began to take over and uh, change the course of history. Um, the part of the reason for that was that was the, the far greater computing power, but also questions about improved al algorithms. But essentially, the potential that Rosenblatt and others had seen in, uh, in, 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 in a kind of a, 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 a model of AI modeled on the brain was eventually sort of realized. Um, and, uh, it actually, some of the earliest, the earliest earliest speculations that somehow we could produce a computer that's model on the brain were came from the the American pair Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts, who in 1943 had argued that particular case. Um, sorry, let me go back a second. Um, and maybe this is going to yeah, this is it. So. Um, Meanwhile, there was a, a group in, in, in Montreal, of all places, um, that uh, was, was, was sticking with this idea. Geoffrey Hinton, who was originally from the UK, from the, a very famous family, who was a great, great son, a grandson of, of, George, um, uh, of George Bull, the founder of Boolean Logic, teamed, together, teamed up with some very talented young individuals, um, uh, Jan Lacun and Joshua Bengio, who were extremely significant in their own right. Um, and they, they believed that they could uh, eventually, um, they, could, they could work on this model and produce something very significant. What they did effectively was introduce far more layers into the whole sort of model. Um, so we got deep learning. Um, and it was in 2012 um, that after all this kind of uh, this suppression, as it were, of, of, um, of connectionism, and this team had to hide all the references to neural networks and, and, and in, in any paper submission because it was so it was viewed so unfavorably that all of a sudden we could see this explosion of potential coming out of um, uh, of, uh, of of AI because of the, 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 the success of neural networks. And it was one particular moment in 2012 that this became absolutely clear in an ImageNet competition where it's, they showed that they could uh, perform much better than any other model. So this is in fact many ways what led to this, um, uh, the, 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 the resurgence of connectionism and the, 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 the realization that actually um, the, the day I could do something. So against the, the, the winters, the two winters that are referred to in this video, um, we have, as it were, around 2006, we could say the beginning of, a, of let's say an AI spring that gradually began to sort of change the way in which we operate. Um, and I think it's safe to say that we're now in a different era entirely. Um, so uh, it was this, the, the capacity to, to increase the number of, of hidden layers up to about a thousand layers and, and the, 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 the GPUs and the, the, the hugely improved computational um, power and, and, the, and the algorithms that, that allowed them to realize the potential of AI. It is, as I mentioned last week, only loosely modeled on the brain, but it's, uh, the terms that you use, the, the, the neurons and synapses, these are all governed, the flow information is governed by the flow of, by, by the weights on the synapses. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and whether or not we can say how we, we can actually claim that it is close to the brain or not, for sure, this led to a huge difference. So when we talk about AI these days, um, uh, it's really about deep learning. This is what has happened since 2006 or so. This is really what is um, uh, causing the revolution, as it were. Um, and this, just to be clear, is part of machine learning, and uh, which is also, which is itself part of uh, artificial intelligence, the broader category, um, which makes it very confusing because the same term was used from 1956 onwards, but the difference is remarkable um, between what we have there now and what we had then. There, there were, by comparison with the kind of the AI winters when there were kind of disasters in terms of research funding, there were three moments that I highlighted in my book about uh, when AI really becomes of, comes of age, or at least the public finds out about AI, because all the research going on was largely invisible. And there were three particular moments that were staged um, deliberately um, uh, that really brought to the public the, the awareness of the capability of AI. The first happened in 1997, 
when IBM um, that they uh, they they challenged Gary Kasparov to a game of of chess um, using their deep blue um, computer. Um, nobody predicted that Gary Kasparov, one of the greatest chess players of all time, would lose, but he lost. Um, and this, what's interesting is each time this happens, nobody predicts that AI is going to win, but it wins. Um, uh, what was interesting too is is the comment that he made after the, after the match. He actually thought that the, that the AI, the Deep Blue, had been cheating at some point. Um, but basically, he was he was outclassed. And I should also say this was be, had been predicted. Alan Turing had predicted that uh, computers would beat humans at chess, um, and Ray Kurzweil predicted that it would happen by two thousand. It actually happened in nineteen ninety seven. And the comment afterwards, I think, says a lot. Um, Gary Kasparov, we just have to understand that everything we know how to do machines will eventually do, do better than us. Everything you can do, I can, I can do better. I, I can do better. Um, following that, there was another public event um, where um, uh, IBM Watson, um, the next chance for IBM was to produce a computer that could deal with a language. And uh, uh, in this case, it took on the two leading um, uh, 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 players at the, uh, 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 and, and, and challenged them to, to um, a jeopardy and, and, and challenged them. And you can see here that it won. Um, this is, this is an, an IBM Watson in the center. And, and Ken, Ken Jennings and Brad uh, Russell were the two competitors. And I think the comment that is made um, here by uh, Ken Jennings, I for one welcome our new computer overlords, kind of says something. It's actually a, a tongue in cheek reference to The Simpsons, but essentially he's recognizing the potential of AI. The next moment was is now become famous in many ways. Uh, there's now a, doc, a very good uh, uh, documentary about it. This was a match that was set up between um, uh, uh, between AlphaGo, um, a system that was developed by DeepMind in London, um, and Lisa Doll, one of the greatest uh, Go players of all time. And I think what's interesting about this is that uh, again, nobody expected this to happen. They all thought Lisa Doll was such a genius that he was bound to uh, bound to win. But he got a shot. Um, yesterday I was surprised, but today I am speechless. And one of the reasons for this was a very famous uh, moment in, in game two, um, uh, move 37 as it's known as. And this is one of a series of slack moves which um, were produced by, uh, uh, by, by AlphaGo that nobody understood. They thought they were mistakes. Uh, and it was only later, in this case, the move 37 is this, um, uh, this black stone here, which is placed on the fifth line very unusually because the third and the fourth are the ones that normally use, but it was placed here. And 100 moves later, it ended up kind of forging a connection with these two here and won the game. Um, but nobody recognized it. And it was in fact, let me just play you a quick video of this. It was actually, even the commentators thought it was, um, it was, a, um, it was a mistake. from the Google uh, team was talking about uh, is this kind of, of evaluation uh, uh, value. Uh. Ooh, that's a very, that's Ooh. a very surprising move. <laughs> I, thought, <laughs> I thought it was, um, but it was, it was a mistake. mistake. Um, and AlphaGo went on, went on to win 4-1. Uh, um, to his credit, uh, Lisa Dahl did, one, did win one, one game in that match. Um, but everyone realized that AI was here. Um, and what's more, the way in which it was operating was beyond our capacity to even comprehend. In other words, we didn't understand the significance of, of Move 37, and AI was able to operate in a way that we couldn't really grasp. And unless it falls within what we call human creativity, we wouldn't understand it. And in this case, AlphaGo really was operating at a level um, beyond um, uh, beyond which humans do. It, it kind of showed up um, the, the capacity of, of human beings. Um, Kai Fu Lee wrote this book um, uh, about uh, the kind of competition that's still been very much going on um, between um, uh, uh, China, between Shenzhen especially and Silicon Valley, uh, speculating about who will eventually become the, the new AI superpower. Um, uh, and he he uses uh, what what he picks on uh, up on is in this particular moment when this match, um, this game of of Go, um, uh, was was being played between these two individuals um, that. Uh, it, it sent shockwaves through China and other Go playing um, uh, uh, countries in the world. Um, the point being that is Go is such a complex game. There are more potential moves in Go than there are atoms in the universe. And they had to develop a system 
beyond the expert systems of, of, of chess that was used by Deep Blue. Um, they had to train, it, it wasn't a question of simply training, it was had, they had to develop a system that learned. Um, and it learned using deep, deep learning and uh, it shocked the world. Um, Kai Fu Li uh, refers to this moment, this wake up call as it were, as the Sputnik moment, um, especially for China. The Sputnik moment in the sense that uh, they said it was a wake up call. It was a bit like in 1957 when the Russians launched a satellite into space and caught in the America lab napping, they were behind uh, in the space race during the Cold War, and that's what led to the foundation of NASA. So Sputnik was the name of that satellite, and the Sputnik moment, in a sense, became was also the term that was used by Kai Fu Li to talk about uh, how uh, AI was going to change architecture itself. Um, if you thought that was impressive, then the next step was even more impressive. AlphaGo Zero was the next generation of AlphaGo systems, and this was able to beat AlphaGo Lee, as it's now known, the first version, 100 games to zero. But that's not as, as so impressive. It's the fact that it taught itself to play Go through reinforcement learning, which itself is astonishing. I don't know, without being told the rules of Go, how it does that is beyond me, but it did it. And this is astonishing. The second aspect I would say that is in some ways terrifying is the kind of the speed at which it was able to do it. Um, it trained itself by playing against itself 4.9 million games of Go in three days. Now, that sounds like a lot of games of Go, um, but actually, when you really think about it, it's a terrifying uh, rate of, of, of playing Go. What that means, effectively, is that it was able to play a game of Go against itself um, uh, 20 times in one second, 20 times of, go, of games of Go in one second. Now, here we've got a hummingbird. Admittedly, it's a slowed up uh, video of a hummingbird um, with probably, I think, about three beats per second here. Imagine that seven times faster. That's the rate at which it can, can play go against itself. So something truly astonishing is happening. And this was an, has been an incredible wake up call. This is really showing us the power of AI, what it can do. Um, and the problem is that it operates at a level beyond that which we can comprehend. We simply can't even conceive of that just as we couldn't understand the move 37 that 100 moves later proved to be so significant. And this I find is a very interesting conversation between Elon Musk, who um, really does appreciate the power of AI, and Jack Ma, who makes this rather naive comment, I never in my life say human beings will be controlled by machines. It's impossible. Human beings can never create another entity that is smarter than human beings. And uh, the, the re reply by Elon Musk, I very much disagree with that. The biggest mistake I see people making is to assume they're smart. Um, people underestimate the capability of AI. They sort of think that it's like a smart human, but it's going to be smarter than the smartest human you will ever know. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so uh, it's beyond our range of comprehension. And one can think about this maybe in terms of, like, let's say a dog. A dog can smell or can hear things beyond the range of human of human uh, 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 senses. Um, but also from a kind of from a kind of a point of view of being smart, AI is going to outperform human beings, and that's very obvious. Let me just quickly show you one example of what I, what I mean by that, or that AI has capacity to come up with solutions that we otherwise um, would not expect. This is a very conventional project. So you look at it, it's a project in Norway, um, and it was a project that was developed using SpaceMaker AI, and, and it, it doesn't look startling, but what's, what was startling was the way in which it, operate, it operated. And what becomes very clear is that, is, is that AI is able to do SpaceMaker AI, which is now had been bought up by Autodesk um, in the last couple of years, SpaceMaker AI is able to come up with solutions that no humans would talk about. So one of the kind of comments that I think that, um, that I, uh, that in, in the book, which I think is very important, is, is this comment here where, you know, he, that, that uh, Howard Hogler was, is, uh, was, was, was talking about what particular project and all these smart architects were there and the computer came up with a solution that nobody had thought about. And that is the significance, I think, of, of AI. It can come up with solutions that we, we wouldn't imagine ourselves. Um, so, um, and again, another project, not, not startling in any way, um, but it kind of shows the way in which it's going to be integrated eventually into the whole design process. And AI, what is interesting is, is and this I think is, is almost the most significant sort of comment that came out of the whole of my book. Um, um, the fact that developers are asking architects to use AI, um, uh, it, it is a requirement from the from their clients that the developers really want architects to use SpaceMaker. 
And why is that? The reason is very straightforward. It's that they want to make sure they're getting the, the maximum return on investment, ROI for their, their plot of land. They want to use AI to maximize that. I'm totally convinced that, that, that in the future, uh, this is going to be a, the case that clients, so the, every, all architects will be using AI precisely for that, and also because the client uh, demands it. The question then was, well, what is going to be the splitting moment for architecture? And I was speculating about this back in May, um, talking about maybe there's going to be a competition where some architects are going to beat the, the best in the world. And there, were, there was a competition where uh, X school in China um, did beat MDRDV um, in a competition but it, well, I gave a lecture at the AA and, and Patrick Schumacher said, no, the Sputnik moment is already here. And he showed me this work that was coming out. This is in May, the very early work that was coming out from DALI 2 um, with the collaboration with, with Refik Anibal, where they were simply astounded by the capacity of, um, of DALI to generate architectural forms that were completely kind of convincing. Um, so it wasn't so much a kind of a, a moment when AI beat the best in the world, but rather than the best in the world, realized that actually they could improve themselves um, by using this particular technology. Um, so it's not a question of, of humans versus AI versus so much as humans with AI versus humans without AI. And what also became significant was that with this, uh, the development of, of, um, of Midjourney is that this was a possibility that was afforded to anyone almost, um, uh, that not just Zaha could produce Zaha buildings, but also people from outside, and I showed you this last week, um, to produce this kind of work it's uh, it was it is and it's come out and it's it, it's 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 so quick and it's so remarkable i don't know anyone who has not been blown away by the capabilities of mid journey and these other platforms so anyway um let me just kind of quickly move on to what is the, pot the potential future of ai and it's important to know that in terms of the prediction itself is of course part of ai it's also um some senses um uh, part of the way that we operate as humans. Um, one comment that uh, uh, um, Ray Kurzweil makes is that the, the reason why we have a brain in the first place is to be able to predict. And he comments about how the primitive kind of cave person um, who's wandering, uh, is, is walking uh, and he notices a, a dinosaur or something or a, a wild animal, I guess not a dinosaur, a, a wild animal um, on the horizon and therefore, ch and therefore changes his or her route to avoid that that um, that danger. So uh, prediction is a mechanism of survival. Niels Bohr um, makes the comment: prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. Um, what I would add to that is is the the challenge of prediction is that if you get it right, everyone says, "Well, that was obvious in the first place," and if you get it wrong, it's obvious that it's wrong, and people laugh at you. Um, but Ray Kurzweil, I would say, is the one person who is, um, I think has been leading the field in terms of uh, these things. Um, he's a futurist, he's now working for Google, um, and he's responsible for a, a series of books where he lays out um, these predictions. Um, he claims that they're 86% true, um, but certainly um, they are, they're proved to be remarkably true. When he comments back in the early 90s about the possibility of, 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 of school kids having a kind of connection to all the libraries in the world in a laptop in their, in their satchel, um, it might seem to us obvious now that, of course, we could do that, but it was it certainly wasn't then, and he was able to predict these things. He also was talking about pandemics in 2012, which shows that he's thinking about other issues too. But the most famous book of all is the kind of, it's, so, so there were four steps then in terms of the development of AI, in terms of the, the, the how you might uh, chart the capability of AI. First of all, um, that when AI reaches a human level intelligence um, uh, would be the first step, and we're in different fields, of course, but we're we're um, we're in that situation already. That AI is better than us in, in Go and, and chess and so on. But arguably, not everything. So we're still not quite there. But then the second moment, um, which is Ray Kurzweil is perhaps most famous for, is pronouncing on the singularity itself. This moment, there's going to be an explosion of knowledge as a, the basis of all these developments. Then there's a term. The third term is artificial general intelligence, which is. Um, is there are different ways of interpreting this. Um, one of the ways is to say it's AI without consciousness or it's, it's, a, it's a, a strong AI. So AGI is AI with consciousness. Um, it's strong AI um, as opposed to what we have right now, which is weak AI, weak AI without consciousness. There's also um, a, 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 an interpretation of this, which you find say in work of David Chalmers, which is to say, you know, uh, it basically means a general purpose um, AI that doesn't have to, can, cannot be limited to one particular task, but do many different tasks. Um, um, but part of the confusion is we don't have the same terms. 
And then finally, there's super intelligence um, or, or ultra intelligence, as good called it. And Nick Bostrom is perhaps most famous for, for, for this, where he talks about the moment when, when there, is, there is so much computation power that actually human beings have made the last uh, invention they ever did, which is to say they've developed an AI that can design other AIs and we're all going to be left behind. Um, the real challenge, though, about this is, is, is both in terms of the dates, nobody can agree on when this is going to happen. Ray Kurzweil thinks the singularity is going to happen in 2045. Um, but the problem, and also there can be no, no one seems to agree, agree on the terms themselves. There's confusion that the human level intelligence is sometimes, con is sometimes conflated with sing the singularity and the singularity itself is sometimes conf conflated with AGI. Um, so it's all a rather vague sort of area, um, but importantly for Ray Kurzweil, this, there was this moment that he called the singularity, this, as I mentioned, this explosion of knowledge. Um, and he has a sense that, 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 that literally it becomes like an explosion. I've mentioned Moore's law, things are speeding up. And then they come to a certain moment, of course, to where Ray Kurzweil, when we have this literal kind of explosion of knowledge um, into the universe. Um, my question would be, though, is really, is that quite how it's going to happen? Um, is it going to be just this one singular moment of explosion? Um, uh, because we're seeing already that there's a kind of differential sort of behavior. AI is good at some things, not at others. You can't necessarily come up with an overall generalization. But nonetheless, this is the basis of the notion of, of, of the singularity, this explosion of knowledge, which is going to happen, which is going to um, uh, change everything um, in 19, and, and he predicts in 2045. Um, the, and a, a different approach comes out with the work of Toby Walsh, who has a book, uh, Machines That Think, not as, in many ways, not as insightful, um, the future of artificial intelligence, not, not as insightful as Ray Kurzweil, but he does come up with one particular comment, which I think was intriguing to me. Um, and that's about the, the future of, of the self-driving car. We can already, and in some ways, see the potential of the self-driving car. Um, I always often think, well, you know, when you order an Uber, um, why, do you, why, why do you need a driver? I mean, why would you need a driver if you've got a self-driving car? Because you've already inputted your destination um, and all the driver does is you know, chat to you in the car. Um, but, but essentially, you could use a self-driving car. It's very clear that that mechanism is going to be in, in place fairly soon. Um, uh, we will have self-driving Ubers, that seems obvious. But the comment that I think that he makes, which is, I think, uh, in some ways shocking, um, is this, we won't be allowed to drive cars anymore and we will not even notice or care. Um, so what does he mean by that? Well, he talks about, in his book, he talks about this progressive sort of situation whereby um, we start using um, self-driving cars. They're incredibly convenient. You know, maybe you're going for a, uh, uh, for a drink and maybe you don't want to drive back, you can use a self-driving car. And eventually we begin to sort of realize, uh, an Uber, self-driving Uber, we begin to realize that actually the, the, that it's more convenient. And we start using driving ourselves less and less and using self-driving cars more and more. As we do that, so our driving skills go, go down. And as these cars become more competent, um, and they are, they will do, they will for sure, they will solve all their problems as they become more competent. So insurance premiums will go up if you drive yourself. And in the end, you think, oh, what the hell, I'll just go and use self-driving car. But the point that he makes, we will not even notice or care, I think is the most interesting one. Um, it'll just disappear and we won't even notice it. There'll be no explosion. It'll simply happen. And after a while, we will notice it perhaps, or maybe not. Um, so, and, and from that point of view, um, you could probably use the analogy of the, uh, the term boiling a frog. Um, uh, I never boiled a frog and I don't recommend boiling a frog, but, but the, the saying goes that if you want to boil a frog, you don't drop a frog into a boiling uh, pan of water because it will leap straight out. Rather, you put it in some tepid water and gradually over time, um, it, it gets boiled without it even noticing. And that strikes me as possibly the way that it will happen, um, that these things will be a gradual transition, not an explosion. Um, maybe at some point we'll recognize that we're being boiled, um, but it's going to be a gradual um, explosion that happens um, over time. So, um, um, uh, uh, so let me just then, then, then kind of wrap up this by, by kind of commenting that I think, you know, what, it's, what was so interesting about all this is, is um, uh, is, is, is the impact of these things have had and the, the way in which the AI spring has come up and people now believe in AI. Uh, what happened to Lisa Dole? Well, in 2019, he gave up playing Go because of, uh, he, he, because of AI. He said, this is an entity that cannot be defeated. So he could already kind of predict that thing. But in, sense, there are, in terms of architecture itself, I think there are two 
particular models, and we, we often mention the AlphaGo match in our discussions about architecture, it is both AlphaGo and also the self-driving car. These cars speak about the, the possibility of that, because point, the point being with a self-driving car, as soon as you don't need a driver, um, that we're in a different situation, or self-driving car implies you don't need a driver. If you've got an AI that can produce your drawings for you, you don't need an architect. Um, and maybe even you could claim that, that, that professional indemnity insurance would 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 de demanding more payment because it's an architect that is more uh, liable to make mistakes than AI. At least that's the way it's seen in the future. We will not be allowed to design buildings anymore, um, we will, and we will not even notice or care. Will that be the case? Um, will that be game over for architects? And I think this points towards the two-edged sword of AI. It is both an amazing uh, tool in itself, um, but also something that is so amazing that it threatens the profession of architecture. And uh, this was the first, well, it wasn't the cover that we used, but on the left-hand side, the first book I produced on AI. And I have a contract also at Bloomsbury for the dark side of AI, a book that's kind of a black cover on the demise of the, prof of the profession in the age of AI. It's not just simply AI, but other things, and AI is going to make it even more difficult, I think, to my mind. And it's precisely because it is it is it is so talent so so um uh so so um uh, uh remarkably good i made a series of predictions in my book which i've since changed because in fact what's happened has been much has happened much more quickly than i imagined i hadn't anticipated diffusion models arriving and being so successful so i've now changed this in my the Chinese translation. I've also changed the illustrations because um, in, 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 uh, we now have amazing work being generated. Um, and the, uh, these were 10 sort of um, uh, uh, predictions I made, which in many ways are kind of obvious, the idea that AI is going to be taught in every school of, school of architecture. Well, I'm not sure that mid-journey needs to be taught as such, but it's certainly going to be featuring the design studio. We'll find out more about that in two weeks' time. Um, the more advanced AI becomes, the easier it is to use. And that's absolutely clear now with mid-journey. Um, you don't need to, to use Grasshopper and all those things. You can generate these uh, just automatically, very quickly. Um, architects will use AI for inspiration um, and, and uh, uh, they will become uh, experts in writing good prompts for AI. I think that is also fairly obvious. Buildings become intelligent. Yes, that should be the case. Cities will be controlled by AI. That's happening now in China where City Brain has developed a... a, um, a, a a, 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 a way of, of controlling traffic through a digital twin um, that has been used very effectively. Um, facial recognition will mean that we no longer carry passports, keys, credit cards, or cash. Well, that's not really an architectural commentary, but that's obviously going to be the case. I entered the States recently um, uh, by facial recognition alone. I didn't even show my passport. Um, initial resistance to AI will fade as AI becomes an indispensable, an indispensable invisible assistant for architects. That's, I think, well, we, we saw that with the digital revolution, there was a huge outcry about it, but now we all use computation. Um, uh, clients will insist on their architects using AI. Again, that's a comment from uh, Facemaker AI. The entire design process will become a seamless and automated incorporating all codes, cost and performance requirements. We'll address that in the, in the future of architect, uh, the office, um, but that I, I'm absolutely convinced about um, will happen. Um, it won't be segmented at the moment, as it is at the moment, We're going from Maya to Rhino to BIM. It'll be all be one seamless platform going from, de from data to fabrication. <clears throat> and then uh, number 10, AI will be, will be able to generate uh, a de architectural designs completely autonomous, which is great, but also that's the problem that we're going to face as architects. So I now want to move on to, to the third part of our presentation um, today, which is to invite some um, contributions from our audience. And I'm delighted that we have with us today a series of very talented architects from all over the world. Um, I'm particularly um, pleased to be able to, to welcome as our first guest, uh, Carlos um, Bannon, um, who is um, uh, from, uh, from Spain, but currently teaching uh, in uh, Singapore University of Design and Technology with Emmanuel Co. Uh, he studied Alicante um, and uh, uh, then in, in Madrid um, um, and is now associate professor in Singapore. And Carlos has been one of the many people whose work I've seen on, on, um, on Instagram, on the internet, uh, which has really inspired me. So I'd like to invite um, Carlos to uh, share his screen um, and to show some of his work. We're going to have a slight kind of Pecha Kucha style here. We can I said five minutes, we can probably stretch a little bit beyond that, but let's have uh, Carlos, please go ahead. Welcome. Thank you, Neil. Thanks very much for the introduction. And uh, glad to be here in uh, Singapore. It's about like 11 p.m. Uh, Sunday, nice time to, to share uh, a small Pesha session. So I, 
I'm going to share just uh, basically a selection of the work I've done using MidJourney in the last uh, three months since it was like, you know, incorporated into my design workflow. So basically, I'm presenting here a, um, a vision on expanding my personal design obsessions. Um, I run in SUTD, I run my, my research lab, Air Lab. So basically, we incorporated uh, digital design and advanced manufacturing um, towards like um, achieving uh, different ways of sustainability in our designs. And of course, I'm naturally attracted to, to AI and, and to, to explore the ways to integrate this in, in our current uh, design processes. So um, I'm going to mention some of the topics that I have explored in the last month that I'm really interested into, and I hope I can explore as well in the, in the physical application. So first one is ethereities and lightweightness in architecture. So this is our, these are images of the Air Mesh Pavilion uh, built in, uh, in Singapore at Gardens by the Bay, extremely light and, um, and slender. So my first um, set of prompts actually with me journey was actually exploring that um, materiality. So I, 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 it was actually my, my first two images or barely my first two images in me journey, exploring that kind of likeness and, um, and uh, slenderness in the, in the construction of these spaces. So uh, the first prompts were quite basic, but it's amazing how um, navigating mid journey, you can um, go deeper and find ways to, to navigate and, and explore, um, you know, different results that you were expecting at the beginning. So it becomes really a tool that can push your, um, your initial thoughts forward. And I think that's why many designers are up to it. Uh, we're not finding images on the internet. We are creating our own references by generating these images that can lead to, to powerful designs in the future. Um, also, I'm quite attracted to create architecture using fabrics and lightweight uh, porous structures. So from here, references of, of the work we have done here in Singapore to, to spaces that could be created using similar systems and then prompts that are getting a bit more um, uh detailed um using uh more selected keywords and uh, integrating materiality color texture spatial properties um some references to 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 movies or to atmospheres those are the ones that create that um kind of materiality another one is the Integration of architecture with the landscape is something I explored with my students um, in design studios. So I call it being the mountain. And this is a series of um, images that explores how architecture could um, make the most of the properties of, of a cliff in this case, and to create something in between, which I think is something that Midjourney can do very well. Those in-betweens, those um, transitions between a and B uh, in a very seamless and elegant way. So, so I was really, um, you know, surprised by the um, graceful articulation of the volumes and so close to a buildable um, construction here, right? So I definitely um, immediately start to sketch potential like sections and ways to to translate this into a spatial um, design. Um, more explorations on how to how to integrate architecture into into natural contexts, and then moving into interiors. Um, I would say it's um, first uh, attempts for for from my side uh, were less specific, but still quite inspiring. The way that those roofs could be constructed. Um, as a massing, uh, also I was looking at at a way to create daring proposals, um, architecture integration with the landscape. So I found this quite sharp and quite um, quite clear when it started to appear, and I, I, I found a way to to control towards this end and also alternative solutions. Um, uh, and, and both actually create quite a strong narrative and potential opportunities to develop. That um, again moving into the uh, experience, the interior experience, it's not fully coherent with the massing that they presented before, but still I think makes sense and complement both um, materials to produce something new. 
these are um, actually quite precise. Those uh, carving, uh, those carved geometries into into the landscape. Um, there's a small like processing in the end to add some scale and some elements, but mostly 99% generated by Midjourney uh, using prompts and iterations. So in this one, a uh, the transition between interior and exterior, I think, is extremely coherent. And uh, it creates um, not just the atmosphere, but precise spaces uh, and um, relationships of scale, materials, and uh, and textures. So we can see here this area on a view towards the interior space from the outside with a very high level of detail. That reminds me of the work um, by Anton Garcia Abril in Canterra and other projects that he's working with the land, with the landscape, um, utilizing it to, to create space. Um, then I move to a more abstract point of view, which is like utilizing the the, the ground as as the as, as the raw matter to create those porous structures. So those are close ups of those um, uh, you know patterns or, or uh, somehow structures, urban structures at a small scale that to me are kind of the seed of, of potential um, urban approach or potential like, relations between um, architecture and context. So again, trying to achieve certain level of detail, the texture, the grain um, that, that produces a strong connection with, with, with the results. Um, also exploring patterns is something that is constantly in my work. Um, this is a small intervention that we just finished with upcycled plastic in, 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 in Singapore. And then those patterns to, to be explored as well with mid journey uh, at cross scale. So not just as a, as a tile pattern, but also as the, as the, as the architectural pattern, creating these um, potential tiles uh, for, for, um, for potential construction. And, um, some of the keywords were um, gravity driven, force driven, and um, try to introduce some structural principles on them. Also here, introducing some scale to create uh, large atriums with those patterns too. And then moving a bit faster, um, showing some of the, the, the those patterns in detail with the texture, uh, creating alternatives and, and, and surprisingly precise and, and developed, you know, all these intricate connections and, 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 um, and brighted relationships between the parts. Um, also, um, you know, interested as well in seeing the construction process, right? So I think I was trying to trigger here a kind of materiality related to bamboo, which is um, quite uh, typical here in this region, but also to, to, to include the construction process, to see the workers, to see the, the you know, the, the process itself, right? So for me, that materiality was very attractive and tried to, to achieve with this set of images. Uh, creating some contrast between lights and 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 layers and um, lattices as well um, to produce those um, under construction images. Also very interested in parametric transitions. Of course, we all use Grasshopper. We try to create adaptive designs. In this case, was um, a work for LV um, creating a, a parametric tile that could be adjust, adjusted to um, to to existing buildings. So the idea was to work and to translate that original geometry, which is uh, this pattern 3D printed in the left and, and assembled in the middle picture to mid journey and to experiment with that. So in this case, the, the, the tricky part was to try to, to use the words to, to define this geometry and to create that pattern that also blends with the um, brick wall and the existing building. Uh, it's an old building. So the idea was to create a smooth transition from the bricks, from the from the you know um, the existing walls into the pattern. Those are um, a bit more uh, uh, of results. And um, close to the end, presenting some articulated landscapes, which is also one of my obsessions to create articulation between um, landscape and architecture to find those in between spaces. So those. Um, were widely spread when they were published. And, and, and for me also trigger many opportunities to work with my students and potential projects as well in the future. So those are a bit more um, probably um, far-fetched in this one. Uh, but here I, I quite enjoy the, the results creating those fibrous structures out of bamboo and um, tall proportions. 
Um, moving to connectors, this is one of the 3D printed connectors I, I, I create um, for the lightweight structures in stainless steel. Um, we use Grasshopper to create and define each of them using the forces. And my intuition was to try to create with AI um, and mid-journey uh, a kind of a new typology of connectors. So on the right is the built one and the left is like approaches using mid-journey. And also challenge uh, praise that we experimented as well with AI to 3D print steel for functional components. Those were the results that we created, but now I think in, with mid-journey, we can take our obsessions to a really deeper level. And those um, results were um, extremely surprising and, and, and rewarding for me and extremely inspiring for future designs. Now in combination with um, 3D printing, those designs are visible. And I think now we are close to materialize most of these images um, in our constructions. Finishing here with the uh, intricate ornaments from Alhambra in Spain, Granada. I use it as a case study uh, to experiment with the um, intricate ornaments and the properties of the light and contrast that I'm also very interested in. Those are results produce um, more close-ups here. And lastly, just more exploration on how to move towards 3D. This is, of course, I think many of us have tried. I think that was my uh, first contribution when you know I, I got this um, opportunity to to create the set depth map and then to create clustering and 3D mesh from the original uh, mid journey image, creating a small um, quick. This was done actually in a few minutes, but the production of this 3D model was almost immediate um, and was rendered with Lumion. So that also draw the attention from some filmmakers and now exploring some collaboration with them. So thank you. Thanks, Carlos. That was great. Um, so amazing. Uh, and it's great to see it integrated, not just in terms of your teaching, but also in terms of the, your practice. Um, let's move on to us, the second, uh, our second uh, guest uh, today. Um, and uh, we, I would like to invite Ola. Ola means the online uh, laboratory of architecture, which is based in um, in Peru. And Peru, it seems, actually has been producing a lot of interesting designers. Uh, the two members that we have of all are here today uh, 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 is uh, da uh, 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 Daniel Escobar, who uh, uh, studied actually at, 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 uh, in Atlanta, Georgia Tech, but not uh, for a master's, not in architecture, but in computer science, which I think is a, an interesting strategy these days. Uh, and also uh, Giovanna Piaka, who is um, currently a professor in Peru itself. Um, and uh, she's been part of the Digital Futures uh, project all along, as is, as is Daniel, and he's, she's currently helping us with our Spanish language channel. So it's great, great pleasure to be able to invite Daniel and, and uh, 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 Giovanna to present the work of Ola. Um, would you like to share your screen? Thank you, Neil, for the presentation. Uh, um, yes, we are Ola. Uh, my name is Giovanna Pillaca, and we are with Daniel Escobar representing Ola. And we are still presenting some explorations and transformations with AA today. And last year we had looked at VQ Gun clip with for image generation. These are some early explorations of using text to drive an animation. In this case, we had used as prom that what is the future of, of social networks? Um, then as part of a workshop we taught last year, we also looked into the possibilities of generating image with sounds. In this case, we had sounds of bears and sound of, of whales. Also, the quality um, is still evolving. We see this as part of a general trend to be able to, to map any input for content generations. Uh, one of the workshop participants mentioned the possibility of using this for, for, for deaf people. And that was a, an approximation really interesting for, for us. Uh, 
Um, we also explored the possibility of uh, creating reactive animation from the text to, to image. These are one of our explorations of how we can go beyond just image generation and add another level of transformation. Taking an original video on the right from an original model element, uh, we input that into a stable diffusion model to run variation based on prompts. And uh, in that, we can see the different patterns that we can uh, explore, like um, rocks or like flowers. And then this is part of a project called Retablo Digital. Here we wanted to explore regional context and culture. The idea was to manipulate the image generation so it will cre recreate an imaginary based on Peruvian culture and we can recognize it in the different patterns and the landscape. We are focused in moving these to the explorations with specific concepts in the prompts that had in the AI codes and different applications into 3D with the readme that the AI is running. And then we start um, looking at strat how to the, the diff and add another layer especially to the image looking for discover new atmospheres into the different space that we are extracting from these 2D models. Uh, and here is the same approach of taking a set of images and then composing them now in 3D space and really start to uh, extrude them in like a three-dimensional way. Uh, so like, is it possible to use kind of like an end-to-end model where you generate an image or like a video um, and then automatically pass it through another model uh, that's a depth map uh, predictor and then begin to compose them in 3D space. Uh, so the idea behind it is like, all right, how do we go beyond just like the image generation? Um, and then how do we develop an end-to-end -end, uh, workflow that can generate these uh, 3D spaces? And then in this example, uh, it's pretty much taking like a sketch uh, or an architectural section in the case from like OMA and then start to animate it. Uh, the idea, uh, start to animate it based on prompts. The idea behind it is like, can we capture of uh, some original geometries or semantics based on the original image and how did those translate into like the AI model, right? Like what does the AI model pick up? So th this is part of that sort of exploration. Um, here it, it's uh, an interpolation of text. Uh, so feeding in a text prompt, we create like an animation by using keyframes, rotations and X, Y, Z. Uh, so you can actually now like begin to like rotate the camera as the animation goes. Um, and it is all being guided by like a series of prompts. And so the idea is that you can now begin to like rotate like the image as, as if it was progressing in like space. Uh, this is another example of uh, uh, interpolation of like a prompt. So you start, let's say, for example, in it with an initial prompt, and then you do an spherical uh, latent uh, interpolation. And so you take that prompt, uh, interpolate it across the various uh, different other uh, vectors that are close to it, and then run an animation on that. Uh, 
Uh, this is an example of taking two prompts and interpolating between them. And the idea was to have the prompts that are similar enough and only changing the materiality uh, in some uh, specific uh, site. So for example, going from like glass in a forest to a uh, uh, curb house, uh, curb fuzzy house in, in the forest at night. Uh, so the idea was to be able to understand like where is uh, the model begin to understand like that difference into the into the semantic space, right? So like all this is being done in latent space. So where does it begin to like divide lines between like prompts? And, and that was kind of like the approach of exploring this. Um, this is another uh, similar approach to that uh, where we start from one type of prompt and then we interpolate between two prompts and then begin to see um, where that sort of line in latent space occurs. And another way of looking at this is how do we make it like multimedia uh, production? So taking like those images, predicting the point clouds, and then out of those point clouds generated uh, sound reactive animation. This was done in collaboration uh, by uh, Will and uh, Voice Chloe. A uh, similar approach to this, so taking like a set of images, interpolating between them, uh, then uh, creating those point clouds and making an audio reactive animation. Uh, and finally, uh, so this is all leading to a very uh, interesting path, which is now to be able to take tests into 3D. Um, and as architects, we are obviously very interested in what, what could happen once we get to this level. Uh, so these are initial explorations of using uh, a model called Dreamfields, uh, where you can input a text and it would derive some 3D uh, shapes out of it. Uh, and these are explorations, so like the quality of these are still um, it, not as good quality, but recently the same authors from the original paper, they dropped a new model that has incredible qualities um, to the point where uh, the results are actually pretty coherent. Um, so we, we kind of like see this happening as uh, eventually like this become kind of like pop, as popular, I would assume like mid journey. Um, thanks. Uh, and, and this is kind of like how those model works. So, so what's interesting about them is that they use a technique called um, inverse uh, of neural rendering. So instead of using like a 3D model or, or being trained on a, a 3D models, what it does is like it uses like a clip to guide the images. And then these images are project, projected in like a 3D space called like a neural radiance field. Uh, and then from uh, different angles or, or points of views, a camera is reprojecting those images back so it, they can be compared to a clip model. And then out of that, you can build this sort of three-dimensional uh, type uh, model, or you can export it out to a mesh or a point cloud or anything like that. Thanks. And finally, this is kind of like some of the outputs that we got. So like we brought them back into Blender uh, and started exploring, okay, like what, what can they be useful? So as the quality of these become better, we would assume that this could actually be turned into actual uh, real 3D components that possibly be in developed into architecture. And finally, we have always a uh, lot of reflections and th the problem of this image is for example that discover what you are in the physical body because it's your power we are a network all that you need to do is be thank you that was all our presentation Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Giovanna. It was fantastic. Um, it was super interesting. Can I just ask quickly before we move on, what, what were the, 
What were the diffusion platforms you were using? Not not Dali or, or Midjourney, is that right? Daniel, sorry, can I ask you? Uh, no, we were using uh, Stable Diffusion. Um, so, so the great part about Stable Diffusion is that they released the weights. Um, so that just kind of like opens up the possibilities to be able to experiment a lot more. Um, so we were able to write some custom code and be able to explore certain things with it. Great. Okay. Um, so let's move on to our third presentation. We have the um, we have the Peruvian mafia here today. <laughs> so our third uh, presentation uh, by, is is going to be by Carlos uh, Navarra, who is um, uh, teaching. Well, no, sorry, Carlos is, is from Peru. He studied at SIAC for a master's, and um, I would simply say that SIAC has been over the has been one of the centers, I think, of of AI, um, both in terms um, of the work of Jovan, uh, Daniel Jovanovic um, and also Casey Ream, who've been the center of a lot of things. Also, I'd say Ben Bratton, who teaches there is, is central to some of the AI that's been going on, but a lot of experimentation going on um, uh, in SIAC. So, uh, and Carlos also has been uh, running workshops for Digital Futures. So it's a great pleasure to uh, to meet you today, finally, Carlos, and to, uh, to see some of your work. So Carlos, over to you. Yeah, likewise, Neil. Uh, it's very nice to meet you, and happy to be here among our friends and these uh, uh, great researchers. Let me share my screen right now. Can you can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I am calling this presentation uh, the next digital turn. Uh, it's a little bit uh, referencing uh, Mario Carpo, and I don't know if we should call it two and a, two uh, second and a half uh, turn or third turn. I don't know where we are actually right now, but we are we are some somewhere past that. Uh, I mean, when that uh, book was actually well, actually released. Um, so in 2020, I was uh, reading very, various books and texts about the state of uh, the new digital era by authors such as Mario Carpo, Antoine Picon, Benjamin Bratton, among others. Um, and in mastering the tools that I had learned uh, and developed during uh, and after grad school um, and through teaching, I started uh, to become concerned about the importance of reflecting uh, uh, the meaning of uh, Architectural expressions of, of this of this uh, era. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm using two screens. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so for Mario Carpo, this question is related to a shift uh, from the classical classical notational representation dichotomy to the point in which now representation and fabrication coexist um, at the same time. And for example, for for Antoine Picon. Uh, the advantage of digital public fabrication um, brought a shift in the notion that there is no longer a distinction between matter and what is computable, and that the that this expression is a uh, is a question of ornament, um, and this is a this is a phenomenon that uh, probably happens at a planetary scale computation um, through cyber physical systems such as Internet of Things or, or smart cities. So it happens at a, at a, it happened at a very large scale. Um, these are some uh, explorations that I started doing in 2020 when I was teaching, um, and it was all about generative design. This was previous to AI, but this is more or less the foundation of the explorations that I that I did afterwards. Um, and already in 2020, um, there was an unprecedented uh, computational power. Uh, from tools that were non-native uh, to the AAC industry and <clears throat> in convergence with uh, subtractive uh, and additive fabrication technologies, um, new aesthetics were developing to the point in which a new language was evolving, a, a new discretism, a new uh, computational brutalism, um, you name it. Um, so um, yeah, we're talking about a, a second and a half or third digital turn. Uh, in which, um, you know, during COVID, uh, personalized training tools started to develop, like call it uh, uh, generative adversarial networks, and then formal material uh, and uh, performative intelligences started started to develop. Um, also, um, 
public learning retrieval was developed uh, with text-based ba models such as DALI, um, and some creative intelli intelligence started to develop as well. And another phenomenon was the hybridization of bits and atoms, which uh, is explained by uh, Antoine Picon in books uh, such as Smart City, um, in which architecture, the architectural uh, communication uh, develops a new semiology or signification, um, and this is propelled by the reemergence re of the metaverse. Um, so these are explorations that I that I developed in formal, material, and performative um, intelligence. Um, that were derived from, from my first exploration, explorations in generative design. Um, these were uh, presented at uh, digital features tutorials, um, uh, digital features uh, workshop this year, and the Cadria 2022 um, uh, post carbon conferences. Um, and another, uh, well, this, this video here uh, represents more or less that uh, state of uh, hybridization of bits and atoms of, of the new city um, and the new semiology of architecture in which um, architecture is infused by uh, virtuality um, and becomes digital. Um, so I'm gonna give just an overview of, of the exercises that I've, that I've done through the past year. Um, this, is, this first one is called uh, GANs Digital Forms and Matter. I either started with a with a project called uh, Tower Gan, um, in which I explored uh, the tower typology um, through training uh, through a training of uh, style Gans and then three uh, D VAE Gan, uh, which was actually uh, and both both models were were uh, trained with uh, image da data sets and also three D data sets um, that end up being um, a tower with a with a core that was developed also with a, with um, a stallion um, from um, with a stallion from uh, uh, images from, from floor plans. Um, my exploration with stallion continue uh, in projects like this. Uh, this this was a billboard that I developed uh, based on the um, architecture of, of Oscar Niemeyer. I collected a data set that I uh, was able to expand. Uh, using uh, scripts in, 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 in with processing, and then uh, developed uh, or started to explore in, into the uh, latent space and variations that could occur, um, you know, through through its uh, development. Uh, and then I I uh, developed this series of uh, of uh, buildings or proto proto buildings, uh, which I called uh, Arcogan. Um, again, with the technique of uh, Stalgan and um, the manipulation of the, of the latent space, um, I was able to produce uh, latent animations uh, that were uh, augmented with digital materiality um, expressions, such as point clouds, uh, blobs, uh, spikes, um, and things like that, and so on. Um, some, some, some. Uh, this, this became a tutorial, and this is uh, some, um, some results from uh, some of the students, uh, which were very interesting. This one in particular um, expresses really well how uh, it translates clearly, clearly the uh, how the stallion is actually three dimensionalized, and then some other, some other uh, explorations um, in which, for example, this, this one that was based in, in fluidity style, uh, architectural style was actually translated into point clouds. Um, so the, the other uh, exploration that I did uh, that is based in the, in, on the personalized um, uh, training um, with GANs was this material intelligence in the circular economy, uh, the end of waste workshop uh, in Cadria. Um, I started with, uh, with an exercise uh, in, uh, with a model uh, uh, TSME um, to identify uh, similarities between a data set and start to group them. And this became the basis of, um, of how uh, we utilize this script to actually group. Um, uh, this was actually based on um, uh, the reutilization of waste. So um, the students were able to gather different images from waste 
and use artificial intelligence to actually to actually um, generate clusters that they could actually um, separate or, um, or manipulate in 3D. Um, and these types of materials like polyurethane foam, for example, or plastics, they were trained through GAN um, and eventually the latent space of these, uh, of these uh, trainings uh, was able to use, was able to, um, was used uh, to generate some sort of a cast or uh, let's call it um, vacuum uh, uh, formed objects and actual, actual uh, new digital materials doesn't exist. Uh, with original uh, and, and informed qualities. So objects like these were developed. Um, and again, um, the animation was um, vital uh, or it's, uh, it had a lot of agency in terms of uh, the materiality that they, they were able to produce because it was an animated process um, that was actually informed by, by uh, um, uh, non-standard um, tools uh, like Cinema 4D, for example. Uh, some other uh, results from students uh, that, I mean, they were very broad. I mean, some, some of them studied um, uh, bacterial states. Uh, other, other students were uh, more focused on just uh, recycling exercises. Uh, but again, they were able to uh, expand on um, animated materiality uh, using GANs, uh, as you can see here. And then um, this was actually um, again the personalized training, but also the public the public um, learning retrieval that I'm that I am calling. Um, we used GANs and and uh, text based models um, for this uh, workshop in in uh, digital future. Um, it had a first exploration on um, how we combined. Um, uh, behaviors with uh, machine learning uh, agents in Unity uh, that were then applied to this uh, to this to this workflow, and as you can see in this case in this uh, in this slide here, um, should play. Sorry, share one. Yeah, um, this is exploring the relation between data sculpture and data architecture. Um, again, um, leveraging the power of, uh, for example, in this case, uh, the VFX tools in Unity, um, non-standard for our industry and how to explore on, um, or expand on digital materiality. Um, so this exercise uh, was based that's why that's why I'm saying that it's more about the public learning retrieval because it was actually based on mostly based on um, uh, disco diffusion. Uh, so the students were uh, able to rapidly generate um, uh, latent spaces with images, extract depth maps, uh, generate three D forms, and then again uh, make use of the animation um, um, to retrieve. Um, you know, different geometries from the latent space. Uh, some results, preliminary, preliminary results from those um, first proto architectural objects that were, that were actually 3D. Um, yeah, and some images about these, uh, these behaviors with, with agents. And we were actually able to create like a, like a, like a, um, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, like a like an entity that would uh, this you know design architecture, uh, and then um, again exploring uh, we explore animation uh, the animation of the diffusion um, to generate certain objects, then uh, expand on the digital materiality of this. Um, this is a, a video of agents actually circulating the generated architecture, and some. Uh, some uh, videos, a video of the of the actual uh, 3D environment using uh, the game engine platform. 
this was an interesting result actually. Uh, um, it used, uh, it used a, a variation of our workflow. It didn't actually use depth maps. It used uh, uh, alpha maps to generate um, better form um, geometries. Uh, this was a student that was interested in, in, in generating facades or, or, or molding details. And um, the results were actually very uh, compelling. And to, fi to finalize this, uh, what is the state of the art right now? Um, well, well, I am looking at uh, diffusion models and also the uh, NVIDIA Omniverse. Um, and um, for these, um, um, yeah, I, I, I've explored a little bit with DALI. Um, I, I, am, I am not like very invested into image uh, generation. But mostly about how to how exploring techniques on, on how to actually three dimensionalize um, the text based uh, outcomes. Uh, I found that Dali was really useful to explore axonometric drawings and um, with techniques that I found online about uh, uh, stereo animations. Um, it's very possible to actually achieve uh, meshes that can uh, be you know um, three dimensionalized using just uh, uh, simple to the images. Um, so yeah, these are some explorations on on these axonometric drawings, um, and you know, utilizing the outpainting outpainting tool in Dali uh, to expand a first image into um, into more generations. Um, and finally, um, again, uh, uh, when we when, Again, what was mentioned in the beginning about the hybridization of bits and atoms and, and, and the development of the city. Um, it is about uh, virtuality infused physical architecture. I, that's what this is what I believe uh, will become the future of architecture. And this is propelled again by the um, uh, the advent, advent of, of the metaverse um, or omniverse or multiverse, whatever you want to call it. Uh, these are explorations that we did um, at uh, workshop last year um actually daniel uh, was actually part of this but you can see uh, explorations in which um physical architecture is again uh, informed by not very scale computation by um, ascension city or city of computation by is a site of mutual interest the platform and this, of the city uh, is last a medium of exchange we developed the interface which, um, is a building block we were able to use the platform for the exchange to, uh, of information and ideas train a brain and the for city an is a site for the exchange of information and, uh, the spatial term uh, of the digital the event of the digital uh, give way to the speech. physical the building uh, of the physical becomes virtual in this way the physical and the virtual are not necessarily opposed yeah thank you Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. Um, great. Um, okay, let's move on to the um, our final two presentations. Who we should both <clears throat> well, I mean, essentially, work that's been um, incorporated to some extent within a, within a kind of doctoral project. I'd like to invite first of all Felice Grodin. Um, Felice is uh, is a, um, a candidate on the, on the doctoral design program at Florence National University. She was actually born in Italy, um, in Bologna, which is where Alberti studied law, um, the, the, the Italian capital of, of food, um, uh, but then moved back to the States um, and uh, studied at Tulane University. Um, she subsequently went and uh, took a master's at Harvard GSD, and she's currently, um, I guess, a kind of hybrid artist architect, um, and uh, she has been teaching at FIU and is currently on the doctoral program there. So Felice, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, Neil, and thank you, Digital Creatures. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can everybody see? Yeah. Um, okay. So basically, um, I'm just going to kind of frame my presentation really about the research I'm doing right now. So it's going to kind of go to the direction of AI, but it's gonna start with a few other kind of strands that I'm gonna tease out. Um, so first of all, this is obviously, this, this is not AI. This image is just a digital object uh, that was created uh, basically in a, a traditional modeling uh, software. Um, and, but basically what's interesting to me about the image is that uh, there's no environment and really the only world, the only kind of worlding of this image is, is the ground. 
Um, and essentially what grounds it is its shadow. And the shadow essentially is um, really kind of complicit to the nature of the object. It's a complicit shadow. It's a projection of the object itself. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of uh, uh, pull at uh, some of Benjamin Bratton's research at the moment. And this slide is actually a slide from a presentation he gave uh, for Digital Futures. And he asked the question, what are shadows? And he started to, in a sense, question uh, that within the kind of augmentation of reality or the kind of simulation of reality. Uh, the idea that there could be the kind of twin or the digital double and that in the realm of this kind of shadow play or shadow boxing, that uh, the digital shadow, I suppose, has its own autonomy. It's got its own agency. It's not necessarily complicit to the original source of the shadow. So that digital object that you saw, actually, I, I used augmented reality and I kind of placed it in uh, where I live, Miami Beach. And what was really interesting about this, this post was that it actually fooled some people. So basically with this, I hope you can hear me, but this person said, where is this? Because I think she was actually interested in knowing, you know, oh, let me go visit perhaps, or, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know about this place. So I replied, it's in another world because in a way, this kind of in-between state, this kind of augmentation of reality is uh, sort of up in the air right now. It's kind of a contestable space at the moment. Um, similarly, uh, another example of my, of my work, um, this is you know, a very kind of standard digital model that we're all familiar with as architects. Uh, this world that I'm, I'm portraying here is a, a building and that building is traditionally something where we could design a priori or post, you know, uh, but it, in this case, it, it did relate to uh, a building that got built and a sculpture that got that got built. But but there's always this kind of twinning or doubling, right? In this case, something that that's more traditional. Um, but I took this process a step further and similarly reprojected that sculpture using augmented reality and kind of um, decoupled it from its original home. So obviously, this is the analog home where it ended up as a, a material object within that built environment. And then using AR, it can be kind of alternately circulated, uh, you know, ad infinitum. I mean, you know, as many times as it can be circulated. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in this idea of kind of circulation and distribution of, of objects. Um, so just to kind of bring that to, uh, a point, um, I believe, uh, and, and seeing what I've seen already today, I, I find this even more interesting now, is the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, as stated by Walter Benjamin in 1935, is really the work of art in the age of synthetic iteration. So, you know, for example, you know, we can, in a weird way, even iteratively go beyond the double, go beyond the twin. And strangely, this idea of, of original and, and copy through modeling, I think is really strange and through kind of iteration of AI is even stranger. So here, these are just sort of versions of um, 3D prints that was part of the prompts in this case. And there's a kind of strange, you know, materiality of a 3D print that, that kind of is reflected in, in these images. But the idea of a 3D print already is a model in that case. So I think it's kind of a rabbit hole that is very interesting in relation to this idea of what is real. Um, in this case, um, I used uh, kind of style bands uh, um, uh, modeling um, through Runway ML and kind of recursively kept training my own work. So essentially uh, the model kind of reflected it. Um, so the, the work to the left, the two images to the far left are my own, just very simple. Uh, polar rayed objects. And the work to the right is essentially, um, you know, AI's kind of modeling of, of my work. But what's really interesting about this kind of iteration, I find, is that it's not essentially my own version of iterating uh, a kind of set of variations, but that kind of iteration kind of takes this work, it kind of decouples that work from me as a kind of source. And interestingly enough, I had this very strange uncanny feeling when I did this because I feel like my versions of the work are actually quite machinic. 
Whereas the, the kind of model, the kind of uh, AI model of the work is actually more organic. It felt more real. So in a sense, the machine version feels almost or, organism-like. So it was, it was kind of a, an uncanny moment. So just to keep going with this, with Bratton's kind of research, you know, this idea of subtitling a shadow is, is interesting to me because it could be seen as a form of shadowing where again, you're kind of decoupled from the kind of original source. Now, in a more conventional sense, I think subtitling or say captioning is something that in a way kind of supports the original image or the original object where a subtitle, for example, in a film will simply translate that, that language into your own, your own language. Or say in a museum, when you look at a work of art, uh, a caption would in a sense, again, extend the meaning of that work. But what I find really interesting in, in the kind of research I'm doing now is this idea of kind of a meta discourse or kind of a speculative and, and sort of critical way of looking at subtitling the captioning or the shadow that in fact, you could actually through this sort of decoupling from the original, you could actually find uh, an area of agency, an area where you could circulate other ideas or other messages. Um, so to the left is uh, Big's kind of um, plan in 2014 of the big U, and to the right is actually Escape from New York, uh, still image. So this kind of interesting idea of captioning, is, of captioning and subtitling, I think is a really interesting space. Um, this, these are actually Dali images, um, Dali 2, excuse me, images. And I feel like Dali 2 um, is really interesting. It, it's good at it, it details or kind of these sort of close up uh, iterations. Um, and I wanted to kind of uh, take this idea maybe of, of the subtitle and the caption and kind of formally, this is just kind of a prototype, um, see where I could go with it. So essentially, I, I, I just took one of those images and did a, a kind of depth um, mapping, which we've seen a few versions of this already. But the idea would be, you know, could this form of architecture serve as a kind of um, uh, a kind of device for for a subtitle or a caption. And I'm not quite there yet, I would say in my research, but what was interesting about sort of taking this uh, type of work and kind of uh, circulating it in the world. And this is, well, wait a second. So, you know, what, could there be a, a kind of a way in which this, this work could be recirculated in a way that either illuminates a kind of uh, different sense of reality uh, that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise? Or could it actually serve in a more critical way, which I'm not claiming this particular work does at this point. So this is just a walkthrough. So I would just conclude by, by uh, kind of, you know, antagonizing this a little bit by saying that perhaps uh, AI in and of itself is already just pretty fascinating, but could it be used in a way to kind of create this, this meta discourse that either perhaps illuminates things on a more sensorial level in terms of cognition, generally speaking, and also uh, in addition to that, maybe allow us to see things in the world that we wouldn't see otherwise in a more critical way. And these are just two stills from films that I think really connects to where we are now, which is until the end of the world um, in 1991, and then uh, They Live uh, in 1988. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Felice. Um, that was great. Uh, let's move on to our final presentation, um, Deepti Dutt. Um, Deepti is uh, from India. She's in India right now. We are spanning the world, South America, India, Singapore, and so on. Um, 
deep tea uh, uh, studies in India, then she went to uh, a study in Yak in Barcelona, a school that I know well and admire a lot. Uh, she's now currently back in India, um, and where she's been uh, teaching as a professor. Uh, and um, Deep Tea was responsible for the first ever AI exhibition in India. Um, she's currently also a candidate on the Doctor of Design program at Florida International University. Welcome, Deep Tea. Hi, thank you, Neil. So, uh, Vishal, you might see also a correction. I was one of the people who did architecture and AI. In India, and the first exhibitions. Anyway, I hope you all can see my screen. So I'm going to yes. keep it really short, and I have a really small presentation today, and this is um, about my explorations with Mid Journey. I haven't included any of my other work or my uh, installation as such. So this is only gonna include what kind of work I've been exploring, what kind of uh, designs I've been exploring with uh, Mid Journey. So my work mostly involves, um, you know, looking into that which I couldn't comprehend or visualize before. And uh, now with the use of Mid Journey, I'm trying to explore these bizarre ideas and concepts and you will soon realize as I move along with my presentation what I mean by bizarre and uh, how this expression of the same, uh, you know, inconscient visual representation, how it's constantly changing with different uh, inputs. So the first thing, the first, I'll be taking you through three of these mid journey explorations. The first one is um, in particular, I'm looking at spaces created by particles, like what it means, what is the boundary of a space? At what point do we uh, start looking at a space as an uh, enclosure? And what is the boundary that defines it? So what kind of boundaries define uh, what a space is? So one of my favorite people is Nikola Tesla, and he starts with saying, if you want to find the secret of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibrations. The reason I mentioned this and this image here uh, is because there is a beautiful sense of space just created by this glow of nitrogen that fills uh, around his generator, and he's just sitting in between that. So although there is a materiality in his generator, there's also a lot of um, definition of a very amorphous space around it created by this uh, glow of nitrogen. And here is a designer, uh, Noah Pimimimia, who is also looking at um, what is the boundary of uh, a person. And he works in uh, designing fashion around the space that is built around a human being. So you can see that it's very uh, ephemeral in its uh, creation. There is no sense of a solid material, but there's still in a sense of a boundary that is being created around that person through his uh, designs. And this is one of his print collections of 2020. And I found this picture is very interesting. So this is one of my uh, mid-journey creation where I was looking into prompts such as uh, what would it be for a particles, for a set of particles to create a space based upon uh, magnetic forces or electric forces where each particle is just bound by the energy of positive and negative or it's just bound by a certain aspect of energy and therefore creating a sense of boundary. And the 3D video that you see here is um, translation of this. Although it's much easier to have uh, more uh, flat material, like not generally like particles. So the translation of this uh, image becomes that much more clearer. And here I've used Touch Designer. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it's a beautiful software that is uh, very enabling for different sources you can input sound, you can work with sound with touch designer uh, images, you can work with 3D. There's a lot of exploration that can be made using touch designer. This is just a very small um, exploration. Here I'm doing image instancing and it's kind of getting mirrored because I'm embossing it. There is an aspect of, you know, it uses tops and chops and so you can just kind of emboss. 
this so it gets mirrored and the same image is now you know you get a whole 3d perspective of uh, the same thing so this was also a uh, touch designer or something that i used as a part of my uh, tech art exploration in architecture and ai and uh, it was interesting to see during my architecture and ai exploration um, i had uh, taken very definitive images of architectural buildings so it was very interesting for me to see that just something so uh, abstract such as particles in space held together is creating these kinds of uh, you know a sense of boundary so to speak so this is you know some more uh, explorations with the same set of idea you know it's held together so you know i say okay at first i'll say it's particles held together with uh, energy or then the particles held together by strings and it's creating an installation so as it gets the less material you see on the left image you'll see that on the right the translation of image instancing gets that much more um, uh, you know, very uh, molecular and particle type. So this is another one. Here I was also looking at what would particles um, come to coming together, forming a set design or a stage design. What would that look like? I think the articulation of that is much better in mid journey than in, uh, when I translate it into this 3D amorphous form, because uh, this image kind of gives you a better sense of boundary than uh, the other one than in the translation so this is these are some more explorations with this and uh, as i finish this set of um, series i'll leave you with this uh, you know we put 30 spokes together and call it a wheel but it is in the space where there is nothing that the usefulness of the wheel depends we turn clay to make a vessel but it is in the space where there is nothing that the usefulness of the vessel depends we pierce doors and windows to make a house, and it is in this space where there is nothing that the usefulness of the house depends, and we call it a home. And therefore, just as we take advantage of what is, we should recognize the usefulness of what is not. And I think that kind of uh, was the central theme of looking at uh, materials that come together to form a space, but also the essence of nothingness within these materials that then therefore create a sense of uh, participation in that space. The second series is I've also uh, worked as a set designer for Bollywood films. So uh, set designing and scenography is something that uh, I'm very interested in. And I wanted to see if Mid Journey can produce these sets of images and how metaphorical can I be and how articulate can Mid Journey get with these metaphors. So with this, I was looking particularly into scenography and with, with the challenge of scenography, I also gave a, another layer of challenge to mid journey. And I was looking into metaphors with life and death. And this particular poem that you see by Sri Aurobindo, who is an Indian philosopher, yogi, uh, an Indian nationalist a poet, and also he was a journalist. And he has an array and a wide, strong uh, collection of philosophical books that he's written, if you're ever interested, and answers most of the questions about related to consciousness, integral yoga, and other things. This is just a small snippet of his work. And I was really looking, this poem becomes important because initially I started with uh, just uh, telling Mid Journey to look at set design or stage design for. Um, you know, life and death, birth and death. I actually was surprised to see this because in spite of giving words such as death, it didn't show me horrific images of human beings or, you know, something as bizarre as that, uh, as that. but it uh, was still something around the, it was trying to understand and imbibe the emotion of death and life. That was very interesting to me. And there's, if, if you see this, there's a lot of bread. And that I understood that as soon as I look into set design or stage design, it somehow uh, keeps getting me red images, uh, something on the basis of red as image outputs. And to kind of negate this, I tried to uh, omit red. And uh, then there was a different, completely different set of series. So I try to give a little more definition to what I want to see as life and what I want to see as death. 
So here is some exploration where I'm trying to tell my journey that the metaphor for life would be something with light and it's floating and there's white light around it. And the something with death is uh, an installation on stage at the top that's looming and dark and just kind of coming down. So these were the kind of descriptions I was giving. And it was very interesting to see that my, my journey was able to catch my descriptions and kind of give me this light flowing effect for life and then have these uh, kind of daunting uh, dark installations at the top for death. And the same goes with the, this image as well. And in this, uh, I particularly segregated life and death with the poem that I showed you actually your window about life and death. So obviously when I get, if you give the whole poem, it doesn't understand, it just gives you two bizarre images. So I split the poem itself into a couple of sentences and wanted to see how um, articulated can be. So if you look at it, you know, life and death and the two different worlds, and then you see these uh, now long hidden pages and then liberating truths. So in this, you will see that, you know, it's two different, uh, like two opposed concepts coming together. So I think this was the image output that I got with that. And with this, it was about uh, how uh, different pages of, uh, you know, it's two different pages of our life. And, you know, it gave me these two kind of independent installation on stage. Uh, and it was interesting to see that it's also useful to, uh, conceptualize stage design with this and you know the enlightening fire and these things when I you know kind of just cut it short and put it as a mid-journey prompt it was very interesting to see that it's able to catch the phrase it's able to catch the emotion behind it and still produce these kinds of effects the next thing I will the last project that I will be talking about today is um, these uh, set of mid-journey explorations that I did with the uh, neural uh, connections and forms and because I've been looking and reading a lot about uh, consciousness and its relevance in uh, the virtual world and artificial intelligence or so forth and uh, David Chalmers is something that I'm also reading and there's one there's a lot of interesting things that David Chalmers says but one of the things that he's talking about because I was really looking into if I do look into consciousness as a subject how do I bring it into a certain visualization because it's so vast and so broad and there are different concepts around it. And, you know, and also when you talk about consciousness, then you're like talking about, you know, separating it from intelligence, separating it from the self. And Anil said talks about different kinds of self, the bodily self, the marital self, the social self. So there's all these kinds of things that actually have been looked into in a very scientific manner, which is wonderful. But what I wanted to look into was how can I see it as an artist? How can I see it as an installation art? How can I, how would I decipher and how would I recreate the sense of neurons and neural networks if I were to create it as an artist and show people the interconnection between neural networks and its activation, therefore, when it comes to materializing what is actually happening within that. So there is this part where it, there's this thing where David Chang uh, asked this question, what does it mean exactly for a given system to be a newly correlated consciousness? So he's actually, here he is talking about a lot of things, but to just give you a general idea, he's talking about the neural activations that can actually be observed in physicalities, observed, so consciousness can be observed in neural activation in uh, neurons, and what kind of neural activation is happening when, say, REM or when somebody's awake? So different kinds of neural activities is correlating with um, different states of consciousness, so to speak. So this mid-journey exploration was really looking into how would it be if I just culture all these neurons in a lab and allow uh, myself to observe these uh, neural activities. Uh, so at first I was looking into different kinds of uh, different clusters of neurons coming together and collaborating and communicating with each other. So these were some mid-journey prompts that I was looking into, but I wanted it all to be in a certain sense of uh, art or installation art. So therefore I've given it a framing with this uh, glass capsule or a glass frame and a glass box. And now I'm trying to, as I would in real life, observe what kind of connection and neural activity could this perform and Midjourney was wonderful in giving me some ideas about representation of its physicality 
which would otherwise be uh, very difficult. And here I'm also looking at, you know, if the neurons were functioning as data centers and multiple neurons, instead of having those uh, boxes as data centers, which is very important, of course. But if I had to represent it, you know, and kind of relate the morphology to our brain and neural network, what would that kind of look like? And here I'm trying to give it some materiality tissue and, you know, adding some more depth and thickness to the neurons and seeing what that would be. And this was, uh, this, these images were um, exploration into that. And this is more of growing the network with tissue and because neurons are essentially like impulses that are being, you know, sent out. So to make it physical would be to just kind of take a snapshot and just freeze it in that moment. So these were some of the explorations into that. And again, this blue and red, I don't know, based on what these prompts get these colors and these images. But it was interesting to see that one set of prompts with tissues give me a different kind of image and another set of prompts, say, a cross-sectional network of protein structure like neurons can communicating with each other give me a blue set of image. Um, so yeah, this was uh, my exploration into mid-journey and uh, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, DT. That was great. Um, we uh, we sort of sit behind in terms of timing a little bit, but we still have some time for a chat um, to to raise some issues. I'd like to um, try and step back and allow the other members, the audience, to to have a contribution. One thing I would say though is, it struck me immediately is the kind of hybrid um, the nature of of these explorations. I mean, AI uh, humans plus AI versus humans, but I think that notion of hybridity has been taken much, much further by all the presentations today. Carlos Bannon was showing how he was kind of connecting up with actual physical practice. Um, and we've had a range of different um, uh, 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 presentations. None of them straight, it seems like straight uh, mid-journey, always kind of mid-journey um, in, in combination with, with something else. And I guess that's probably a, a hint or indication of the way that things are likely to go so fantastic presentations um the, the, the other thing i, I but i want to just maybe kick off the, the discussion i mean they may welcome me to 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 either put uh, questions into the youtube chat or the billy billy chat um or um uh, if you're on the zoom call to to uh, maybe ask your question in, in person um but i just wanted to kind of to ask daniel a, a question first of all the the discussion about um uh, what uh, the future of, you know, what kind of architect will populate the office of the future is an interesting one. I mean, in, uh, 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 and, and uh, so, so you've studied, uh, I've done a master's in computer science, which is interesting as a, as a, a strategy and you know, producing some remarkable results. Um, so, um, but, but I guess there's always a debate going on between the kind of David Deutsch notion that the future of architecture is going to be dominated by super users, you know, people with a advanced training and computation like yourself. And there's also a kind of a, I think that what Midjourney does is the opposite. It actually opens up um, uh, uh, the, the platform to people who've got no, very little computational uh, experience. Um, so maybe Daniel, your question for you then would be kind of like, uh, uh, do you think that's a, that sort of, that, that's a, a way of thinking of well, that kind of approach of, of going to study in, in computer science is going to be a useful way to get ahead in this new AI dominated culture. Um, I think um, so, so the reason that I did it was just because I was naturally curious about like AI and machine learning. Um, so, so it was something that I just felt like if I really want to understand it, I had to do that myself. Um, but I think what was currently happening is that as the sort of, let's say like the creative side of um, AI or like this sort of industry, as it grows, it, they're just gonna come up with like tools that are like much more easy to use and it's gonna become so much more commonplace that um, I don't think you need to understand what's going on behind the algorithms. Um, it, it, it's, it's sort of like, um, there's kind of like this thing going around, like you just become a prompt engineer. So if you master that, like you, you're able to output like pretty interesting things. Um, so I'm not sure if kind of like somebody that's like going into architecture or something like that, they have to like, well, become a computer scientist themselves. I think it's just more or less of like understanding, uh, either the potentials or the limitations of like what the current software offers. And if somebody's like, uh, selling specific software, you know, like what, what is the limitations? Like why is, 
Um, what are the outputs that you get out of mid journey and what are the reasons that some of the things works? Uh, that, that's like why I was a little bit focused on like understanding like the interpolation between prompts and like how modifying certain prompts or like specific keywords would change like the overall output. Um, so just understanding those key things. So I, I also, I can't predict like what's gonna happen in the future because everything's moving fairly fast in like the past two years in this area. Um, so we're now at a point where like you can generate like video from text and like 3D output pretty consistent. Um, so I think just being on top of those things is probably like the more helpful uh, situation right now. I guess my thinking has always been there's, there's always room for both. I mean, uh, I think the, the, the experts that could like people like you or, you or Daniel Bollinger who could and look under the hood as it were and start try and, and work with the, the, the techniques themselves and then versus others like myself who have less of a computational understanding of the of the actual technology itself but can, can use it in different sort of ways but i think what's interesting is the kind of the very inventive way uh, that things are going to, to open up um so uh um i've got a question here from um uh from the the youtube channel from someone called Buren. um uh, thank you for all your presentations I'm wondering if anyone can comment on your their thoughts surrounding the ethics of using AI in the architectural field. Um, I can respond to that, but I think I will leave it to, 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 to one, of our, one of our presenters today. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, we've lost Carlos Bannon. It's, it's past midnight in Singapore, but uh, maybe, I don't know, I think maybe, I, wait, I don't want to put uh, on the spot, but uh, either Felice, um, who, uh, um, has kind of, I guess, has an interest in the kind of ethical side of, of art production. Uh, whether you'd like to kind of respond to that one, uh, I'll, I'll try. Thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the ethics of it are. I mean, obviously, this is an evolving situation as, as we speak. Um, you know, what what is again? I, I go back to the word agency. You know, what is going to be the agency of of the architect and the artist moving forward? I mean, for me personally, I'm interested in this idea of, of circulation or this idea that circulation, not as far as the, the plan, say a floor plan, but, but the circulation of, 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 of kind of getting things out there in the world. So, I mean, I think that um, the value of what an architect or an artist provides, the very value of what we can do, what our affordances are above and beyond computation, I think is gonna be something that we have to take on ourselves and, 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 and make public, you know, so I, I think that that's sort of a, a reflexive thing involving the field. But then what, what are we actually doing? I mean, I had a talk recently uh, in, in, within our program that was about, if it's not about optimization, then what, what is it about? So I think these are, these are really big questions that need to be addressed. Um, we have two questions in our group here, uh, Samir and Igor. Well, maybe Samir, first of all, you'd like to just uh, um master question well, well hi guys i'm really impressed by the quality and the effort of the uh, serious research and linking that to the practice i was really amazed but you know I, i'm also as a professor of architecture and as a practitioner so i have this inner fear that this might be I, i'm not sure about um the, the conclusion is this is really something that would boost our innovation or it would be something like an aid that we will lean on and that will um, decline our innovation, maybe decrease our innovation and the and the innovation of the future generations of architects. So um, not only dealing with the, the end quality of the architecture product, but, but also in the learning process and in architecture education. So I, I wanted really to share that fears with you guys. And it, it is an open end question that is open and there is no different right question. I think there is no different right question up to now. So if you have insights dealing with this matter, please, could you share it with us kindly? Let, let me just say that I think this is something that uh, Memo Acton wants to raise next week in our session, um, uh, whether it kind of, you know, is, is cramping the innovation of, of individuals. I, you know, I, I, it, the, the, the point that, that was made by people like uh, Michael Hansmeier, um, a kind of quote from him in my book, he basically says that, it, that AI can, be a, can become a muse and it can extend the capacity of what we can do. Um, but I think it's not just extending, it's also mutating and changing things. But I'd like to see if anyone else wants to, uh, to respond to that question. 
Uh, I can give it a shot, but um, so uh, I recently had a conversation with somebody who we were talking about like how like there's kind of like cell phones now, there's computers and things like that, and these are kind of like they're they're essentially like all extensions of us, but they're kind of like become like these new prosthetics that we kind of use to do our things. Um, so like in the idea of like using AI in that sort of sense, which is part, kind of like part of like the natural evolution of our extension. Um, I, I wouldn't say like it's going to decrease innovation or it's going to be like some sort of hindrance. I, on the other side, I think that being able to compress human knowledge through like AI systems is actually going to push things a lot faster than we probably can think. Like if we're able to compress like all these images and text into like, uh, I don't even know, like billion parameters or something. And then like, I don't know how many people are using Mid Journey or like Stable Diffusion now or Dolly, but they can generate and produce things like fairly quick. and and um, that that's pretty amazing. Like I didn't see this like when I started. Like when I started starting machine learning, I didn't even think it was going to be possible to like do the things that is, that are happening now. Like to be able to generate impactful images just from text. Um, and so I think that is actually going to push not only like the technology forward, but also the way that people are interacting with these things and how they come up with creative tools to actually like manipulate them. Um, and, and that just becomes more of like human creativity and how people develop creative ways of using them. Yeah, no, I, I, I would certainly agree with you. I also would say that I, I was shocked myself by the emergence of these diffusion platforms. They came way before I thought they were going to come. And of course, they've, they've upset everything. All those books that I mentioned actually are kind of out of date because of their illustrations. I would like out of date now. But just to say, I think, I think you're right, Daniel. I think that... Uh, I, I mean, I, I think this in terms of, of uh, um, the expen extended mind thesis of of, um, uh, uh, of uh, Andy Clark and um, David Chalmers, the, and, and what they do basically is they, well, and David and, and Andy Clark's book on the natural born cyborgs. What essentially he's doing is is taking the idea of Merleau Ponty, whereby you have tools that you use to, um, let's say a, a blind person with a walking stick, that becomes an extension in the sense of the self um, uh, uh, in terms of the body schema, so the physical operations. But I think in terms of, the, of, of, of seeing it as a kind of a prosthesis of the imagination, of the ascended mind, it's a way we think through. And I, I don't see, I think there are going to be novel ways of operating where we will take this and, and, and push it. New, we, in fact, we're already seeing that push it in new directions. So um, I completely uh, agree. Um, uh, so um, uh, we've got two, we've got three questions lined up. One from you, well, first of all, then from Alberto Fernandez, and then Hania uh, Kelligian. I hope you pronounced that right. Right. Uh, so you would like to ask yours? So you can hear me. Yes. So I do believe Professor Nish and all of their presentation today take extremely optimistic attitude towards AI, including the all of this artificial uh, intelligence problem, how to produce the model, architectural models quickly, as Neil called in the age of AI. But however, I want to ask you a provocation questions here today, actually a range of the AI program illuminated a repeat in-state image phenomenon, but what the practical result will achieve in the future as will become the bottleneck technology in the future, or as we'll never have uh, any chance to achieve in real life, or no any citizens once was needed needed in the end as we do a project, we do a real project in architecture as in organizations, the programs, not doing a table games as the careers, the table games. So we normally consider many human values and humility, social, economic aspect, and like a specific state condition as how to um, connect it with the public space, commercial space, education facility space, and the real estate. We're considering some uh, more about the specific state uh, situation. So that that is lots of the intangible knowledge we need to consider in doing a co 
before we do be, we do a consumption project. So I do not believe the AI we are considering as more about the human as a civilization. So how do you think about that? I want to hear all of the speaker <laughs> speak today. <laughs> some uh, ideas yeah as a yes. uh, last mm -hmm. last year you know on the quantum pad cover of years ago the room who has did the countryside exhibitions uh, at new new york as hey his ideas is reflecting and let us considering more about the countryside is our future not we doing more about the programming in superficially way so so how 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 do we thinking about that <laughs> yeah yeah okay let, let me see who wants to respond i would just i would simply say that i don't think that that ai precludes those things not at all i mean i think there are, you could take into account anything you could you know uh, address all those kind of questions it's more just about and we think we're in early stages but maybe i could ask ask one of the um, panelists today to to comment that I think it's, it's, it's going to be a, a progressive um, effort. You know, um, it's going to take time, but it's it's hard to predict as well because, for example, uh, and I was talking about 2020 in my presentation because I I, I was not imagining you know the the, the pace in which this thing is going to uh, be advancing. Um, so you know, I mean that the text models could be uh, advancing, uh, you know, at a pace in which, you know, video will become. Uh, Better resolution, 3D will be will be uh, will be you know at hand, um, and and that could be that could be fast and it could, it could take longer. I just I think that um, we need to address AI in uh, in a way in which um, it's more of, more or less like like a companion of, of our profession, um, and and see and find ways in which it can aid to to design right. It, you know, either it is through optimization or um, through creativity. I mean, uh, people discuss about you know if it's such if it is actually creativity, but it is somehow some some sort of creativity. I mean, it produces ideas that um, architects have not think of before. So I think those two those two those two uh, paths are developing. Um, when you talk about the uh, urban growth, you know, in, in the countryside, you know, tools like. Uh, um, uh, what is this company uh, place? It's not placemaker, but you know the company that is uh, actually developing uh, AI for for uh, urban design. Um, it's pretty advanced. It's pretty advanced already um, through machine learning, and um, I think we just have to engage with those tools. Um, yeah, I, I, maybe I think that uh, we are getting an echo. I think of what's hap what happened in the late 80s, early 90s, the kind of resistance to, to the use of these tools. I mean, I know as a student, I was a student in Cambridge at that time, and uh, uh, we were banned from using these tools in, in the studio. I think I mentioned this before. And, and what happened was basically there was a generation of, uh, of, of, of graduates who were unemployable. So I think there's, there's no option, you know. And I don't see them as necessarily precluding other options. I think the point is that you can use those tools to address anything. And I thought that we saw that today um, in terms of questioning even terms like reality and so on. So I, I think I, I, I don't see them as a, as, a, as a limitation, but I, what I will say is I think what we're seeing just with mid journey is simply a kind of a sketching tool that actually is only limited in what it does. And what's going on, and I mentioned this last week, I think, is, is that you know, they're in the pipeline right now in terms of development are other tools that are gonna go far more deeper into the whole sort of design process. And they're gonna be the important ones, but I think we're getting a glimpse in some way of, of the potential here, but uh, I don't think it precludes all these things. I, one of the comments that, that, that I come across before was that uh, the idea that somehow that, um, uh, that, you know, well, hold on, this AI hasn't got the emotions that I put into this, my design and so on, and all these things, it doesn't have that, it's not as rich. Well, I, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not so convinced it isn't. I mean, what I, the results I've seen um, are produced by the machine are as good as any individual could produce. Maybe I can move on to um, uh, ask uh, Alberto is to ask his question, and then we have Hania with also with a question. Alberto, welcome. Well, Alberto, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, firstly, uh, for... Can, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. I, with my iPad, so maybe I, my audio is not uh, the best. But, well, firstly, thank you for all these uh, outstanding presentations today and all the... the 
new law that is already coming and happening in, in our field. And, and based on that, I was just wondering to ask you in general, uh, to, any, to anyone, uh, basically, um, what do you think about the democratization of AI as a basically the, oh, the as a huge opportunity to finally uh, jump into the third digital term, term in a way? Because now I, I know I, I'm, I'm here. I'm part of this process of a, a constant evolution or rapid evolution in terms of uh, artificial intelligence in the in the architectural and design field. But um, we must democratize this. Yes, I think Serious, seriously. Uh, in which ways, I don't know. That is the, my, maybe is my question for for all of you. How it's possible to democratize this uh, for all of us, for all the people that is already involved in the process of design in different scales? Yeah, one thing that I wanted to mention before is that um, it, it's not even up to us. You know, um, the thing about AI is that it's it's actually um, getting embedded in in culture. It's 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 a thing that has a, the power that. It, that gets in, in, in involved with culture. It's not only about architecture, you know, it's it's being used in music, in cinema, you know, in all these industries. And um, when that happens is is when it actually um, informs architecture because we we are we are grabbers, right? We we, we like to grab from an, from other industries and other disciplines. And um, um, yeah, and it also this this comes in waves, you know. Uh, that's what I was actually actually uh, commenting with someone the other day. I mean, it has been advancing with a set of milestones. And I think that it, it we reach a milestone like maybe in August, July or August, in which it democratized, democratized, yeah, it democratized like in a way that it, has, it hasn't it has happened before, right? Because like right now, anybody can use it and it will be, it will, um, it will start to produce, um, outcomes um, from people that you know are not related to, to this field but it will be actually created you know i mean it's not that because we are researchers we're going to produce maybe more interesting things that people that are just touching it for the first time um so yeah i mean you know it, it will it will take time you have to identify the milestones yes and um to, to respond alberto I think that at the moment, the, the uh, different applications are very democratized if you have internet. And if we are uh, going to the real problem, maybe to, to use different technologies, is the, um, is if you are available to, 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 to use the internet. And in Latin America, only the 65% of people have access to the internet. And uh, that is a, a problem around the world. And at the moment, uh, architects are um, ha have the, the, the open way to, to use different applications. But for example, in my uh, way, I use the AI not for have only beautiful images. I prefer thing in how or what I what I can use these apps or these technologies to recreate a new imaginary because with AI or without AI, I usually recreate imaginaries and make a speculative words. And uh, the AI, for me, is only a, a, a new tool to continue uh, helping the others. Uh, my country, in my country, people with uh, my, my culture and reimaginary the present and the future. And open minds to, to think in new types of architecture, new types of uh, live with others and um, thinking that, that we have the responsible in the tools that we use and we can use these tools to make things to for for bad things maybe or to 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 help others in I don't know maybe like in, in grow together thinking in in a positive way or in a positive future. 
Um, I think that it is, uh, that's my, my point. Thanks, Giovanna. Um, I should mention that we have, we have half of Latin America here today. Alberto's from Chile, although he's doing a PhD currently at the Bartlett. He's also a professor at the Bartlett. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, to invite Hania to ask a question. I should say that another aspect is uh, the digital divide, I think, is absolutely very real, Giovanna. And I think that's really a concern. I mean, Digital Futures is trying its best to democratize education. That's our aim. But I mean, the whole time you're faced with these things. I mean, I think that, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, I, I'm going to the Cadia conference in a few weeks' time, and I just wonder how anyone could ever afford to go to a, to go to that conference if they weren't from a kind of North American uh, context. Um, you know, I think so. There are real challenges there, and I think you know I would also sort of say that you know just in terms of access to internet uh, and the cost of things, if there is one country right now that is suffering, it's I think it's someone like Iran that is where not only is the internet being cut off, but such as the, the economy now that nobody can afford you know, What we take for granted, which is actually not so much money in our terms to be able to kind of pay to use mid journey or Dali, or whatever, that would be exorbitant in a, in a country like, like uh, Iran. So uh, Hania is from Iran. She's currently doing a PhD at uh, Arizona State University, I think. Uh, she's an architect by training, but she's also like many of the presentations today, blurring the boundaries or redefining, shall we say, what is architecture? Anya, welcome. Salam. Thank you so much. Salam. Um, thank you so much for all the great um, presentation. I really enjoyed that. But uh, my question is that all like mostly these um, images that have been produced um, in this presentation, like and even um, this, the uh, images that I produced with Mid Journey and Dali, it really depends on how these like. AI got programmed and how like the system architecture behind these tools work. So my question, and this is a real one of the reason that I am uh, participating in AI Spring be because I want to know what is the like architecture con contribution in all of these conversation if we do not right, like really understand or know how they these machine work and are we just got reduced to be the users of these machines or are we becoming like storytellers or what are the skills of like this new generation of architects who wants to uh, work with these AI and how we can have like you know more agency I would say in um, creating a space with uh, these machines. Well, I think I know my answer to that but I need to know what other people I would say. Um, uh, I don't know whether Deepti would like to comment on that, because in terms of storytelling, I think that's something that uh, is really central world building and so on, which I think is where your work and you maybe overlaps with Deepti's a little bit. Maybe would you like to say Deepti something what you, you think about this potential? Yeah, I, I think right now, like I think we had this same discussion in the last uh, session, AI, what is AI? And we're talking about how we are really in the beginning of this nexus of what AI is going to be doing. And there's a lot of things that it extends out to. As architects, I think maybe we're only looking at a small portion, a small window of you know, designing and how we can get it to 3D and how we can then generate drawings because that's something that we're very used to. And that's also something I struggle with in class. And I'm like, okay, I'm an architect. I need to design and you know, be able to construct something in 3D. But there's a lot of other things that it can do like communication, for example, like, you know, uh, human machine communication, and it can optimize and, you know, again, intelligently optimize. Now we're talking about artificial intelligence, but I think it's a good time right now to really think about if we are just humans who are intelligent, or if we have other capabilities, which is, I think, very daunting. Constantly, we ask if AI is going to take over, because we are so attached with this notion of intelligence, that we think, oh, we were the most intelligent species on this planet, and now there is AI and it's going to take over, but that's not the case. I think our capacities go much beyond being intelligent, and I'm glad that AI is here to show us like a mirror that, you know, we're not just intelligent, we're capable of many other things. For example, um, looking at meaning and having a certain motive to do something. I don't think AI is capable of self-motivation. I don't think AI is capable of uh, defining and willing to do something as of now. It's not really willing, but we as human beings are really willing to look at the issues in the present, for example, urban cities. And we're looking at how can we solve that? That is our willingness and how we translate that willingness 
using a tool such as AI, something that AI can help us with. It's not really anything got to do with uh, how intelligent it is compared to human beings. It is just intelligent because it's able to compute intelligibly. You know what I mean? So I think we will be looking at issues. We will be the ones looking at, you know, whether it's urban issues or whether it's optimizing fabricational uh, structures, you know, and now uh, Carlos was talking about omniverse, which is also another very interesting thing because you can communicate between uh, robots that are there in uh, far off destination uh, based upon remote destinations and you're sitting somewhere else and you can train it based upon your idea of what you want the robot to do. And then, you know, that self learns and then starts creating these different things. So there is a lot of application and there's a lot of um, ways that we can apply our mind and our will and our motive into what we want to do. And that is not yet there with the AI. It doesn't have a motive by itself to say, okay, I am AI and I want to do this. I don't think it's something that we've seen, but we as humans can, and I think we must, yeah. No, I think, I think you're right, Vidya. We're a long way from that, but do we need it to be conscious? Do we need to have a sense of I? And I, I, I just would say that kind of maybe Stahani is sort of come, I've seen some of these tools being used um, as part of the kind of the, the Iranian protest movement that's going on right now. I've seen them being used in Ukraine to, to raise consciousness. I think they're essentially this is a tool that has many applications and it doesn't doesn't tell you what to do. I mean, it's a, <clears throat> it doesn't define things. That would be to say, technological determinism you can do it and you can do what you can with that tool according to the affordance of the tool and i think what we're discovering right now is that there's a whole new terrain of possibilities opening up i i was kind of um, uh, reminded in, in this discussion right now is about the comment that ben bratton makes that we're only in the silent movies period of, of computation and ai is even more recent you know what is so interesting today about today's presentations is that with the field has been defined and opened up in interesting kind of new ways i think the question is ultimately is whether architecture itself as a definition is going to change be, be, because of this. And I think what I'm what we're seeing already is other people potentially can use this tool to become architects, as it were, but also architects can use the tool to open up in, in, in other directions. So you know I, I, we're seeing history in the making. So um I'm I'm just I'm just wondering if there's any final comments. We want to try and wrap things up since uh, it's it's late for many people. Um but uh, it's certainly been a fantastic discussion today. Um uh Oh, uh, Agnieszka has a question. Do you want to ask your question before we, we, we finish, Agnieszka? Uh, do you want to ask it or, or shall I ask it for you? Uh, sorry, my internet is kind, kind of breaking. That's why I, oh, I see. Okay, okay. Uh, but I wanted to ask, because there is such a diversity today with the presentations, with um, all of them were super amazing. So I wanted to ask to you all, do you think there will be any um, part of architectural design that will not be touched by AI or computational design, like never? Because you see, there is such a diversity that I'm kind of seeing that everything will be, so. Or do you think that everything will be touched by it? I, I, I just want, was it, I meant, did I mention this before? Bill Gates made a, made a comment in 2002. He said, by the end of that decade, there will be nothing that will be untouched by the, the digital. And I think that, you know, I suspect we're in the, the, I think we are clearly in the decade of AI. And I just put my uh, four cents worth, my, my penny worth of ideas. I think that there'll be nothing untouched by AI by the end of the decade. Um, but uh, I, maybe I'm an optimist. I'm also, I would say, a pessimist as well, you. So um, I can see the dark side of things. Uh, do we have any final final comments from anyone uh, to, to, to throw in there? I realize that we're very late, especially for, uh, we have members here in Barak. Uh, Barak is in, in Japan. Um, Samir is in, in Beirut. And Jeska is in Poland. Uh, we have uh, um, a Vasco from, uh, from uh, uh, Bangladesh, we've got uh, Yi from Europe, we've got uh, Deepti from India, we've got uh, Alberto, and we've got the whole South American mafia here. We are really, I think, spanning the world today. So I think this has been a fantastic session. I think what I would say is that, you know, 
the debate has just started um, and it's not the end of the debate, it's the beginning. And there's, I always remember that kind of comment that Winston Churchill made in the Second World War, saying it's not even, it's not the, the, the beginning of the end, it's the end of the beginning. And I, I think we're at the beginning of the beginning right now, but I think next week we'll see from Memo, we'll see some really astonishing work. And Memo has an, an incredibly holistic way of thinking about things in terms of um, different, uh, of, of, uh, of He's a real universal man. I'm going to finish off with simply a final, um, uh, uh, if I can share my screen a second, um, to mention that uh, um, next week we, ha we have um, uh, a, se a, a session on, on uh, Saturday on um, uh, a, a tutorial on 3D printing with Grasshopper, um, on digital futures. Um, and then on, on Sunday, uh, we've got an undoctoral consortium session again. Um, I want to finish off today. Then I want to first of all thank everyone for their contributions. Really astonishing and really thought provoking. I thought it'd be more discreet. I thought we'd be talking about mid journey, but it was mid journey and. And I think it was really that really kind of blew my mind the kind of the inventive way in which people have been using these, these tools. Um, but it was certainly incredibly interesting today. So I want to, uh, and, and we, we had uh, the, uh, I want to thank also the people behind today's session, especially Bavlin for helping organize things. And finally, I want to say a special thanks uh, for Giovanna, who was, um, who was responsible for the kind of the little intro thing we had. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna just play out, play us out with the, with that one more time. So thank you everyone and see you next week um, uh, with, uh, for the session with Memo Acton. Thank you so much indeed.